conducting this June 29th meeting of the um, CIRMS board. And um, I'd also like to welcome anyone who is attending this meeting on the telephone or um, uh, by other electronic means. And before we start, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Scott Tosher to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. He's standing here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. If you would continue in your official capacity and call the roll. Sure. Haifa Abdul Haq. Mohammed Abusalam. Present. Dan Vernal. Present. Kim Barrett. Present. George Blumenthal. Present. Maria Bonneville. Present. Michael Botchin. Linda Boxer. Present. Judy Chow. Present. Leandra Clark Harvey. Present. Anne Marie DeLiege. Isabel Durome. Present. Mark Fisher Colbury. Fred Fisher. Present. Thank you. Elena Flowers. Present. Judy Gasson. Present. Larry Goldstein. David Higgins. Present. Vito Mbassiani. Present. Steve Julesgard. Rich Lahara. Present. Pat Levitt. Present. David Lowe. Present. Linda Malkus. Present. Shlomo Melmed. Present. Christine Miaskowski. Present. Lauren Miller Rogan. Adriana Padilla. Joe Panetta. Marv Souther. Present. Michael Stamos. Present. Carol Watson. Kevin Ju. Keith Yamamoto. Present. Great. Thank you. Abel. Scott, Scott, this yes. is Haifa. I'm present. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Um, I'd like to um, continue with a very short report from the chair. Um, this being the uh, first official meeting, I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, CIRM staff, particularly for the very, very warm and accommodating welcome they've given to your new chair. Um, and since I've taken over in very, very late March, I have been um, very assiduously getting to know the breadth of CIRM's presence on the cell and gene therapy stage. Uh, to wit, um, I have been now to visit six of our nine alpha clinics. I've been to UC Davis, uh, UCSF at the Children's Hospital in Oakland, uh, UCSD, and uh, with a side trip to the Sanford Consortium, uh, the City of Hope, and uh, UCLA. Uh, the, uh, the staff of the, each of these alpha clinics has been extraordinary in their welcome of uh, the contingent that I brought with me. And I want to thank uh, Jeff Lomax and others on his team for facilitating that. It's no easy uh, manner. We were quite a perturbation in the daily activities of all these centers, but they came out in great numbers. They welcomed us. They toured us around. They advised us uh, at a very high level of the scientific endeavors that they were engaged in. And it was really a very, very wonderful Thing, I think for CIRM to do to show our presence on all of these campuses and to learn what they're about. Uh, and um, and I, I think the, the benefit was mutual. And I have to tell you that um, not just in California, but in all the other places I've been, of which I'll name a few in a second, the, uh, the perception of, of CIRM's presence and its accomplishment over the last 19 is really extraordinary. People all over this country, uh, I've toured Yale's labs and, and other people, and I've been to a number of the national meetings uh, where 
the recognition of what CIRM has created and continues to support uh, is um, it leaves people breathless. And I, I don't use the adjective very, very lightly. Um, we're the envy of the world. What, what has been created by the people on this board um, and uh, in this room and other people who have served who are no longer on the board. So congratulations to you all. Uh, June was extraordinarily rich in the number of large meetings of the research and therapeutic communities. Uh, it started about a month ago with the um, ASGCT meeting at the convention center in Los Angeles, thousands of people uh, from all over the world uh, coming to give reports on their scientific inquiry and to make um, connections, um, followed by LA Best, an extraordinarily well-run uh, beautiful meeting on the campus of UCLA, um, and then the sprawling meeting uh, in Boston of the International uh, Stem Cell Research um, Organization, hosted uh, by the president, um, uh, Haifan Lin, um, at which, by the way, um, young Robert Klein Jr. was publicly awarded um, a commendation for his work in heading up the campaign that resulted in the successful passage of Prop 14. It was a well-deserved honor, and uh, it was the only one such honor at that meeting of the president's reception. So, uh, and uh, Robert was there with his family to receive that reward. And finally, uh, a very interesting, very exciting meeting uh, for a number of days up at Lake Arrowhead in Southern California, which called itself the first annual Southern California Regenerative Medicine Symposium, which brought together all of the entities uh, in Southern California, expanded to include places that don't have medical schools, such as uh, UC Santa Barbara and Caltech. Um, and they reported on all the vibrant research that was going on in their centers. And then finally, I met with um, the president, our, our CEO, Maria Milan, and her entire leadership team individually, and then sat in on their meetings um, of their whole teams to meet them all, find out a little bit more about what they do so I can be a better communicator uh, to the people of California of what we are and what we're about. So it's been a very, very busy month. I've um, still got a few more sites to visit. And um, I think there are a number of people in this room, I think, that are next on the list, right? <laughs> um, I would like next to um, tell you, uh, he's not here. We have a new board member. His name is Kevin Zhu. Spe last name is spelled X-U. Uh, he was nominated by the Speaker of the uh, California Assembly. And I'll tell you something about him. He's going to join us for the first time in the our September board meeting. Uh, he received a Bachelor of Arts in Neuroscience in 2011 from the University of Southern California. Um, he's very, very involved in a number of national and international boards. I'll just name a few of them. Uh, he was appointed first to serve by California Governor Jerry Brown to the California-China Trade and Investment Advisory Group. He's a member of the Los Angeles County Medical Health Commission, and I think that that's what um, uh, that it's that credential that um, uh, caught the speaker's attention in appointing him to be the patient advocate to the mental health community. Okay, we should know that uh, he's involved in uh, the Clinton Global Initiative. I, I I'm only giving you a very highly select rendering of his CV. Um, he's the director in Beijing of the, uh, and I think this is an, um, um, what's the word, uh, um, eponymous, when it's, the institute is named after yourself, uh, the Rongjiang Regenerative Medicine Laboratory, which is under the United Nations Academic Impact um, Program, uh, president of the International Society of Regenerative Medicine and Wound Repair, He's also on many advisory boards, including the Rongzheng Zhu Center for Regenerative Thera Therapeutics at Beth Israel at Harvard, uh, California Institute of Technology Neurotechnology Center, California State University Los Angeles, 
the Presidential Council, the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and the Kevin Zhu Initiative at the Rhodes Trust of Oxford University. In 2014, he received an Impact 100 recognition at the United Nations, and a few years ago was awarded USC's Young Alumni Merit Award. So a very accomplished um, young addition to this a board of directors will meet him in person in September. Uh, third of my four points, uh, I very carefully listened to a number of the comments made over the last three board meetings by members of the board. These are uh, questions that arose about our budgeting process and how it uh, supports, highlights, and selects, if you will, uh, areas of scientific focus. That's a fancy way of saying, how do we prioritize um, applications that, uh, that are worthy of support here at the board? Uh, how do we prioritize? Should we prioritize one area of inquiry over another? How do we implement the mandate of Prop 14, the specifically the $1.5 billion that are uh, earmarked, if you will, for um, neuroscience? Um, the neuro task force of this board is presently involved in exactly that activity, a very precise and deep analysis that will um, is essentially an exercise in prioritization. And they will be reporting on that at today's meeting. Um, I am going to shortly when I'm done, uh, turn over to President Milan, who is going to elaborate on this very topic in her report. And I am taking the prerogative of, of asking the science subcommittee to formally take up this issue of prioritization based on comments made by many members of this board. Take it up and uh, at their own pace, study it and please report back. And finally, um, in advances, we're in our 19th year uh, at CIRM. In, advance, uh, in, in light of the advances made in basic science and clinical medicine, I have a thought that it is now an opportune time to consider expanding our government relations activity, which at present are limited to Sacramento, spearheaded by, as it has been for years, by our now former Vice Chair Art Torres. I'm thinking we would profit from having a working relationship in the Washington DC area with closer proximity to the work of Congress, as well as the federal agencies, including the FDA and the NIH. In touring around the state, uh, as part of all the, the activities I've mentioned early on, I've identified at almost every center a good number of interested and uh, engaged stakeholders with expertise in this area um, who might like to contribute to that effort and who concur in this idea that the time is right to have um, uh, a more active involvement in government relations. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm gonna pass the gavel to President Milan. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Isabel, <laughs> Isabel sorry. While she approaches the bench, uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the welcoming Mr. Zhu, but at the same time would like to say thank you very much for the service of Al Roulette who has been a calm, smart, and engaged presence for 11 years. And I'm going to miss him dearly, as I think a lot of us of, of us will. And I think uh, I would like him to know that we appreciated his service. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel, we did reach out to, to Al. Uh, we would like to have more formally honored him at this point particular board meeting. Um, he's asked that we hold off on that for a little while. So it'll come up at another meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, may I please have my slides or do I just click? Oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Ambassiani, members of the board, members of the public and dear colleagues. Today, I'll be providing a one-year, a year one update on CIRM's five-year strategic plan. 
that was launched shortly after the passage of Proposition 14. As a reminder um, and a very important reminder, CERM's mission is to accelerate world-class science to deliver transformative regenerative medicine treatments in an equitable manner to a diverse California and world. This remains our North Star and everything we do really leverages on this mission. Since its formation, CIRM has been at the leading edge of uh, creating a, a whole new field in regenerative medicine. And this field is now coming of age. There are more and more programs making it to the clinics. There are now thousands of clinical trials worldwide. Most of them are still in early stages as they are in CIRM's portfolio, where though we funded 91 clinical trials, 58 of them still active, the majority are still in early development phase one and phase two. However, over the past several years, we have seen a, um, an increase in programs that have made it all the way to FDA approval to make it to the marketplace. And to date, 29 cell and gene therapies, actually 30 as of last week, have been approved by the FDA. And I'll go into that in a little bit. As shown in this pie chart that represents what the field looked like in 2022, just a year ago, Cell and gene therapy does still compose a small proportion of biologics that have been approved by the FDA, so it is still a very early field. Today, I'd like to give a status update on where we are in the field, the challenges that are before us, and what CIRM is doing to address those challenges in its mission. So to speak to recent um, announcements, Last week, Sarepta, which is a gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, was the first gene therapy that was approved by the FDA. What's remarkable about this event is that Peter Marks, who is the head of the division, CBER, the biologic division, overturned his own reviewer's recommendation not to approve this. Why is this significant? He sided with the advisory council which looked at the data much more closely and took into account the nature of this disease. It afflicts the young. It is devastating. There is no treatment. So they looked at the data despite the fact that the, um, the study design and initial design uh, endpoints were not met and looked at the post hoc analysis and saw that in four and five-year-olds, there was an efficacy signal that matched biological um, surrogates, or actually not even surrogates, real markers. So in gene therapy, there is the, um, the encoding of a, a, a protein that helps to reverse this disease. And they could see that the expression of this protein correlated with improvement in function and in the health of these four and five-year-olds. So because this was under accelerated uh, pathway designation. Uh, Dr. Marks had, um, had a, you know, moved forward with the approval of this therapy with the provision that there would be post-approval confirmatory studies. So this is called the accelerated pathway. Just to remind you, Dr. Abla Creasy from our the head of our therapeutics program had updated the board that 11 of our programs have expedited pathway designations that would follow this type of paradigm. So we know that the regulatory paradigm is shifting, okay? So the pipeline is growing. We are seeing innovation in the regulatory arena. This is great. Furthermore, our programs continue to make progress. For instance, one of our programs, which was a spin out at UCF, of UCSF, which is a pluripotent stem cell derived neural product for, that's been used to treat intractable focal epilepsy that is not at all responsive to any medications. Um, is being carried out by Nerona, which is a spin out of uh, the UCSF program funded by CIRM. We funded it and supported it through early stages in translation. It's now in clinical trials and that they just reported at the International Society for Stem Cell Research a couple of weeks ago in Boston, a one year follow-up on one of their patients and there's more coming through. 
where there was a 90% reduction in seizure activity and all of the kind of the associated studies to go with this. This is just the start. And then with cell therapies, which is cell and gene therapies, that is what distinguishes it from traditional drug development, right? There's early signals, small studies, effect sizes large, the impact is huge and it's one-time treatment. So just bear that in mind. It's a completely different model than what is out there um, for traditional even biologics. So with that, we have, we ourselves have built a very robust portfolio and pipeline. Um, Dr. Mbassiani, Chair Mbassiani had, had um, uh, referred to the board's discussion of potential prioritization um, within this broad portfolio. So it's a very important topic uh, given that there is a massive increase in the types of programs coming through our programs. But the snapshot of where we are today, the cumulative programs that have resulted from our grant making process is that between 30 and 35% are in this neuro field in general. You'll hear a little bit more of a much more um, precise analysis of this in upcoming meetings um, as led by the Neuro Task Force and, and Dr. Rosa Aviles, who is our um, VP of, their, of scientific programs. But about 10% in, in cardiac, 18% in malignancies, 10% in musculoskeletal, and uh, quite a bit in other diseases with large targets such as diabetes. And this is done through a predictable and recurring program announcement, which uh, program um, opportunities, which Dr. Gil Sombrato, our head of portfolio and grants um, review, will be highlighting in his talk following mine. But here is what we have done, what CIRM has done, what this board has approved to date. So in, in, in total between Proposition 71 and the current Proposition 14 funds, as you see in the top row, the cumulative investment into discovery is, about, is over $1 billion, same with clinical stage programs, over a half a billion dollars in translation, which again is, distinguishes CIRM from other funding agencies. We are, our brand is a translational funding agency, but also significant investment in education, um, nearing a half a billion and over a half a billion dollars in infrastructure, both building infrastructure, but also major programmatic infrastructures, which are most of the programs you have been seeing come through to you recently. And in the prop, Proposition 14 era, this continues uh, very rapid, uh, very robust um, um, funding across all, all five pillars. And then the fiscal year 22-23, where you'll see in more detail where Panay Simpson, our head of finance, will give an update on our expenditures with what the board allocated for this fiscal year. But you'll see that there has also been a significant amount of investment in all the five pillars. I won't read the numbers, you all have them, but happy to answer any questions related to any of these. So we're funding all these programs. This is an integrated approach. What we strive for at CIRM are, is an end-to-end -end solution, funding programmatic infrastructure, building for the future. Why? Because we know that cell and gene therapy is a new field. There are so many places where it can fail, even if it's useful. I'll give you a, a use case of that or a demonstration of that shortly. Um, it's been called valley of death, all, where programs, even with promise, just fall through the cracks and not able to make it to the next stage. There are two valley of deaths, actually, right? There, there, there's one going from very important and promising science and discoveries to be able to translate this into something where you can create predictably a, a therapeutic product candidate. This is a, a living medicine, so a very variable, new system, completely new types of technologies need to be developed, so it can fall through the cracks there. If you get through that part, you can get into clinical trials, which is fantastic. And we're starting to see that as, as uh, indicated by some of the um, progress reports we have been providing. However, it can still fall through the cracks and making it all the way, even if it's very near being approved 
into the clinics. And then even once approved and initially in the clinics, it can still fail to reach the patients in need, especially the disproportionately affected communities that are underserved. So these are huge challenges. And there are many um, stakeholders and interested parties in this, but what is CIRM doing? CIRM launched a strategic plan that this board had approved in December of 2021, shortly after Proposition 14 was passed. And we organized our strategic thinking around three thematic pillars or three themes, advance world-class science, deliver real world solutions and provide opportunity for all. They're very deliberate and concrete tactical um, um, objectives under each of these pillars. And I'm just gonna give a very high level accounting for what we've done this year at, to open up discussions. So in terms of advancing world-class science, there is an open RFA for our shared resource labs. You've heard about that from Dr. Uta Grishmeyer and um, Rosa Avilas in past meetings to discuss how this really can empower the scientific community for collaborative science and to be able to provide those resources to more um, labs and therefore um, um, accelerate um, the science through synergies. We funded the first programs in the Manufacturing Network Partnership Program led by Dr. Sean Patel, with huge assistance from Dr. Sohail Tali from the Therapeutics Development Team and Dr. Ross Okamara. And that program is just about to launch this board, um, funded the first of those and the description and the objectives of that were described at prior meetings, but you know, happy uh, to answer any questions on that. And you will get updates, by the way, on all these programs as they launch and progress. And as you know, the alpha clinics that Dr. Bassiani had referred to, the expansion of that is now across uh, uh, California with nine centers. And the promise of that is not just that their facilities and their people, but it's the amazing potential that that core uh, competencies and um, resources across these programs will really um, provide a um, opportunities to address these barriers that are that are um, that are represented in the schematic diagram above. And as you know, some of the first programs we launched were education programs to train the workforce of tomorrow to build a diverse, culturally sensitive and skillful workforce in all aspects of uh, development and uh, of education and of med medicine and healthcare advocacy, all aspects. Um, so what else is um, being set up this year? The uh, patient support program, which you heard um, described in prior meetings, the RFA for that is now open. That's under development um, by the team. And you'll hear more about some of this in the roadmap presentation by Sean Turberville. The community care centers concept development has been underway. And as partner to that, there have been a series of listening sessions, which many of you have been participating in. Thank you very much. And the most recent, it culminated in a statewide listening session in Sac Sacramento last week, which was amazingly successful, just so rich with, um, with um, insight and problem solving and discussion. Members of the board were there. Um, and I'm sure that at some point they will be able to share there. Um, we we're very fortunate that we had members also lead the panel such as Maria Bonneville, Isabel Duran. And so we're really fortunate for that, for that level of engagement, um, fantastic. All right, so, and later on, you'll hear the um, initial draft of the roadmap for access and affordability from our chair uh, the, um, will be introduced by the chair of our AWG um, working group uh, and then presented by Sean Turbeville. Okay. All right. So here's some, a little bit of more kind of demonstration cases. We've presented, um, Sean Patel, our, our head of business development and alliance management have presented at many prior um, uh, uh, board meetings and also at BIO and he and I and members of the leadership team have presented all around the country. Um, I had describing the CERM funding model and how it de-risks 
programs and are able to get them through these valley of death. And it's something that, as uh, Dr. Mbassiani had pointed out, is the envy of many and also a desire to partner with us because of this opportunity. The most recent of this is especially notable in this current financial climate is a program out of UCSD led by Dr. Stephanie Cherkey as the um, PI in a rare disease called cystinosis. And it utilizes a gene therapy platform, which was developed by Dr. Don Cohn at UCLA. So it was a collaboration that was actually enabled by the Alpha Clinics Network and just this ecosystem that we have. And Dr. Cherkey um, was able to bring that to a point that it received um, industry um, attention. It, AbraBio had licensed it. And most recently, Novartis had acquired it for $88 million. Um, subject to milestones, et cetera. This adds to the total of tw over $24 billion in industry investment into our programs. So again, just highlighting CIRM's value proposition and role. Even in times of economic challenges, it's a source of um, reliable support and funding for high impact, um, scientifically um, meritorious programs such as this. Next slide, please. However, again, speaking to the point that we can overcome all these things, but then reality sets in. We still have many challenges ahead of us. And this is something I put initial success is also a problem statement. And this is a very loud, underlined, bold problem statement. Um, you will recognize Evie um, on this slide. She's a, 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 a now over 10 years old. This is just a year or two ago. Um, she, as an infant, was treated with Dr. Cohn's, um, under Dr. Cohn's trial for this condition called ADA, skin adenosine deaminase deficiency, um, an enzyme that leads to um, inability to form an immune system, also called bubble baby disease. She's been cured of this for over 10 years. Furthermore, in that same trial, 50 babies have been treated with 100% survival and 90% efficacy, one-time treatment. Paradigm shifting, <clears throat> paradigm shifting, remarkable. Orchard Therapeutics was formed with this as their lead program. They shelved this program um, in June, 2021. Because of CIRM funding and all patient advocacy and all of the efforts toward it, there was an agreement by the company to return the program to UCLA so Dr. Cohn can continue this program. There have been, there's now an active ID that they, they, um, that they were able to uh, provide under pre-approval um, pathways through the FDA. And the, the first few patients have now been treated under a treatment protocol. Um, the problem is still not solved. But one of the things, a key theme that we're hearing, and we've heard it at AAWG meetings and elsewhere, is that for, for conditions where there is, such as this, there is no, no other treatment, there is no other cure. Well, there is treatment, but it's symptomatic. And in some cases, there are no treatments. What do you do? Sometimes these are the best treatments, you know, that even un, an involvement in a clinical trial. In this case, it's an extreme case where they're actually already had benefit from it during the trial, not saying that's in every trial, but if they're not accessible, then there's no chance of that. Okay, so what are we gonna do about that? Um, first off, um, just a reminder that over half of our development portfolio is in rare disease. It's in the very condition that is probably the most challenging of the cell and gene therapy. Cell and gene therapy is a space has a a considerable amount of challenges. Even CAR T therapies that had been licensed to biopharma, it's been recognized that there were challenges in, um, in how manufacturing and everything else. And um, it's, still under, it's still under consideration as to whether the biopharma model is the appropriate place in general, you know, at least in the early phases for these therapies to be developed and distributed. However, one of the problems is because for each indication, there's so few patients, the finances don't work out. It doesn't fit into business plans. It doesn't fit into the typical commercialization models and pathway. What do we do? Rare disease and aggregate is significant in terms of disease burden. As you can see the numbers here, even though each one may affect 
less than 200,000 and ultra rare cases even fewer. Um, cumulatively, cumulatively, in aggregate, rare disease affects 30 million Americans. Um, it's significant. So one of the opportunities with cell and gene therapy, especially these technology platforms, is that although you're developing a program for a specific rare disease, for instance, one can imagine an approach where it actually could be applied in a platform technology across diseases and even into more common diseases. So those are the opportunities. Not only could they address unmet medical need, but it develop technology and platforms that can be applied more broadly, as well as develop the, the parallel needs in terms of the healthcare delivery um, coverage and infrastructure that's needed in, for cell and gene therapy in general. So it's almost like the first child um, going out there in the world. So much of what our discussions and our activities in this past year especially, but has been percolating throughout, have been in large stakeholder engagement in potential solutions. Um, we've spoken to those um, uh, foundations um, and patient-driven initiatives that have run, actually run end of one uh, trials with, with regulatory um, support because for those, in those cases, sometimes those are, that's the only child that has been identified. And so th that platform is something that is not gonna go into a commercial you know, model. However, a lot has been learned from that um, and there is a need for it. Uh, Fyodor Ernov, who's one of the pioneers in the field of cell and gene therapy, had written a opinion piece uh, in the New York Times at the end of last year, speaking to the, um, this problem statement of we have incredible potential, especially with CRISPR editing and next generation editing, base editing, et cetera, for actually curing disease. Again, single treatments, similar to the scenarios we mentioned. What's, what, what, how do you do that though? Um, some of the um, involvement that, that we have in partnerships, uh, Abla Creasy and Sean Patel are pictured here. They are our um, representatives to the uh, bespoke gene therapy consortium, which involves the FDA, the foundation for the NIH and the NIH and CATS, major groups, trying to determine whether a bespoke platform-based approach could address broadly across indications. And they, and Abla and Sham led a discussion at the recent um, American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy in LA. And then we were invited to a think tank in Washington, DC, convened by concerned scientists who see the promise of their work, um, but know that there's nowhere to kind of um, receive it on the downstream. And we, along with NIH, members, uh, the director of ARPA-H and CIRM, scientists, FDA, um, we discussed novel regulatory approaches, collaborations that could enable platform approaches discussed models such as point of care manufacturing, which is something that can be supported by our manufacturing initiative, for instance, and even nonprofit models and academic based models that may supplant a biopharma type model, at least initially. So those are still under discussion and we hope to be bring, able to bring back um, more information on some of these considerations. One of the things that I, I wanted to say is that CIRM is uniquely positioned. We get invited to all these discussions because our funding model, our infrastructure, the way you know our ecosystem, our projects themselves, um, we have a very unique opportunity to again remain on the leading edge of where we are and in the challenges with cell and gene therapy. And we do this in partnership. So I wanted to acknowledge some, you know, not not everybody is up here because we have heard about some other um, accolades and 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 awards, but you know, our board, our patient advocates, our GWG reviewers, and our scientists are all world-renowned leaders in the field. And so I just wanted to um, highlight a few. David Williams, who was funded under our, our um, sickle cell cure partnership with the NIH from Boston Children's, who partners with UCLA and UCSF in our alpha clinics on the sickle cell program, um, was awarded the ASGCT Founders Award um, uh, several weeks ago. 
uh, Rain Roos, who's an incredible GWG member, kudos to Gil and team for building such a, an, an August um, uh, GWG um, team, really to review our programs that can be brought to you. Uh, Rain um, has been a leader um, in, the, in the advancing DEI broadly across the community. She's a pediatric oncologist at, um, at Baylor um, and uh, Texas Children's. And of course you recognize, oh, right underneath the picture, <laughs> <laughs> our beloved uh, board member and leader, Isabel Duran, who basically was the reason the call to action during the COVID times uh, that led us to, to where we are with our DNI initiative, again, with the leadership from a uh, former board member, Al Roulette, we're uh, greatly uh, indebted to, to your leadership for that. Um, so Isabel, as you know, has been appointed to the National Cancer Advisory Board by President Biden. This has brought a wealth of information and connectivity to us as we consider our programs. Um, Joy Cavanaro, who's been a long-term, again, GWG member on the, in the arena of regulatory sciences and uh, development, received the ASGCT Catalyst Award and other scientists, California scientists, such as Helen Blau, Crystal Mackle, and others were, um, were featured speakers at the ASGCT, and in this case, Helen Blau at the ISSCR presidential plenary, where she uh, reported on uh, the regenerative medicine um, program she had funded by CERM for muscle, um, muscle um, regeneration. So just, in, just to uh, recap, CIRM's funding model has built a robust and diverse portfolio and pipeline, uh, therapeutics development infrastructure and education programs. Our five-year strategic plan has kicked off. We've been um, very happy with how we've done on this plan for the first year. That's all seeding the pieces, putting the pieces in place. Um, to and with the mission of advancing our mission, well, the mission with the objective of advancing our mission um, of, of delivering transformative science, to clinical trials and therapies and making them accessible. And this funding model and strategy are adaptable to real-time advancements in the field, emerging priorities, programmatic direction from this board and opportunities to uh, advance CIRM's mission in areas such as rare disease, CNS, topics of, 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 uh, that'll be discussed today, as well as other potential priorities. And so uh, I'll take questions and then I, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Gil Sombrano, who can, will lay down kind of the, the how we do it, right? Um, in terms of the funding, the, what the eligibility is, how this pipeline was built through our uh, machinery. And that hopefully will provide some, you know, um, initial perspective in terms of what is possible as the board um, uh, engages and continued co uh, programmatic considerations. Um, so with that, Chair Bassiani, I'll turn it over to you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Member Tuscard. <laughs> yes, Maria, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the slide that's headed initial success in CGT is also our problem statement. And that's the Don Cohn. Uh, area, a, a therapeutic area of, uh, of SCID. So let's assume for a moment that uh, there's never a commercial partner to be found for that particular disease, uh, and yet we have a very successful treatment. What's our thought process about where we go in that sort of, that set of circumstances? And I want to use that as a potential model for others that may fit that, because there are a number of commercial issues that come up with these sorts of diseases, the first of the number of patients that are involved, the smaller the number, the more difficult it is commercially, um, you know, what it is that is involved in the treatment, the cost of, of actually uh, preparing the treatment uh, for administration, um, a number of other issues. So let's just assume for a moment there is no commercial partner. How have we thought about that? So um, those are, that's a very, um, important topic, and not only is it important, it's actually in, in, in front of us at, at that we are, um, in order to, for us to actually continue to bring these programs forward, those are the, we, we need to, this, we need to actually come up with solutions to that in real time, because we actually have them in front of us today, okay. Um, 
One of the things I should point out is that I mentioned that there are some programs that are already on the docket for approval this year in sickle cell, for instance. There are two programs, one out of Vertex, one out of Bluebird, that are for consideration in December. Uh, mentioned the one in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, one in hemophilia is coming up, I think another one in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So some of these have, are actually being fo brought forward by commercial entities. So we will learn from that. We're also learning from Novartis, Gilead, Kite in terms of what they've done with CAR T's. That'll inform, you know, what um, innovative solutions have been created in, in, in that context. And, and the, so that it's still, it, it, it needs to be determined whether there is a, an adapter solution that will be able to take our academic programs and then be able to make them ready for this. Some of the things we're putting in place, such as the manufacturing network and the partnerships are intended to help create that adapter. There are, there are some cases, and many have talked about it, where it may be that they never go into, into these programs. Speaking with the head of rare disease, the rare disease programs at many of these companies, Novartis included, which did, they did take up our program, they have said there are some programs they are, would like to pursue. They have in-house people working on it, but they're not going to take it to commercialization. Um, I assume they're also working on solutions, and we will continue to be in touch with them. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a paradigm that's very, sim with a, that's very similar, not exactly the same to something I'm familiar with, which is um, organ transplantation, where it was a life-saving advancement, where infrastructure and policy and, and you know, national um, infrastructure needed to be put behind being able to make this happen. It um, remained um, within the practice of medicine with standards put in place, but it is it's very much academic based. There are, there are um, infrastructure programs funded by the HHS for the organ procurement organizations and how that's run through the UNOS, for instance, and then local por organ procurement organizations. Industry has been built up for immunosuppressive medications, anesthesia, all, you know, organ preservation so, uh, solutions. So there's the kind of the, call it so-called picks and shovels industry that go around that to support it. That's another potential model. We don't have the answer yet, but we are engaged actively with um, testing some of these models. One of, one of them is this uh, bespoke gene therapy network, for instance, and uh, Abla and Sham and upcoming meetings will describe some progress on that. The idea behind that is that the NIH, FDA, CIRM, um, other companies, patient groups are trying to determine whether we can bring in efficiency to even the nuts and bolts of how you bring these therapies forward. So for instance, building the best platform for the vector, for the gene delivery vector that then links with it an evidence base that the FDA could be very you know, um, comfortable with to facilitate accelerated approval or expedited pathways, but then having an agreement from the community, we will use that platform. It kind of takes out some of the competitive aspects of what typical, um, typical drug development is, right? The secret sauce. No, everybody gets the sauce <laughs> because that's gonna allow you to make, you know, to come up with your, your end result. And so it, there's a whole new paradigm that's gonna need to, form and accompany that for that to take hold, but there, are pro there is progress and we'll continue to bring forward, um, you know, just kind of the how to's and that. And uh, we do have opportunities between CIRM funding models, our requirements, our ability to convene and to promote this type of um, collaborative approach. Um, it's not an answer because there, nobody has an answer yet, but it's the approach that I hope that um, I brought some light to. Thank you. Uh, member Chu. I have a um, related follow-up question on this. So um, I think you mentioned about for big pharma, the model of cell gene therapy actually may not be the right fit. And, and from what I can see in the industry, I think this is a trending coming that way. 
And I used to run also a big organization, hold the PNL responsibility. I would say that's really hard to incorporate the cell gene therapy model. So in a sense, also, I think the thought has been, I mean, from the industry point of view, it's going more toward this is going to be the mid, mid or small size of the pharma company model may fit better. Mm -hmm. um, so my question then is then from CERM angle, are we, have we have been uh, doing something um, to build that partnership with the big pharma? And are we changing that to more like target mid-size or small size of company to make sure there's an exit, there's a way to get the uh, medicines to the patients. Thank you so much. Um, Sean Patel is our uh, head of business development and he's built quite a, um, a, um, a significant industry alliance program where we do have um, partnerships with uh, developers as well as manufacturers and other you know, interested parties in this space. For that very reason, um, they see the value in the CERM de-risking. They see the value in our in our robust portfolio. They uh, part of the, the one of the basic principles in forming the manufacturing um, uh, network is that this would provide an opportunity for early engagement um, and influence by industry partners um, along the way, so that when uh, potential programs are ready to, to be picked up either with them as manufacturers, a partner, or even take it up altogether, that those programs are more ready for that. So it's, you know, it's both cost efficiencies and, and, the, and the suitability for transferring. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, Judy. But it, I, I think uh, my question is then, so when you mentioned about the relationship we are building and are that I would assume that's probably with much more established big pharma currently. Is that correct? Actually, no. We have a lot of relationships um, with investors, with smaller companies, um, as well as larger companies. So some of the some of the larger companies that are in our industry alliance program are um, Bayer, um, for instance, which you know has with it Ask Bio and Blue Rock which uh, recently reported on their Parkinson's phase one, encouraging a program. Um, and um, Novo Nordisk, um, but, and, and their, their engagement with us on is, is not only on the program, but in, in, in capacity and infrastructure, and they see the value in partnership. And so at, at Sham had presented um, several months ago and he'll be ready to, give an update on many aspects of our, our, uh, these business alliances, but we're also happy to have kind of a smaller um, group recap and we're, whenever, I know they're extremely busy, but when you have time, we can schedule that. Thank you. Thank and you. If I can exit totally separate question, just for clarification, um, you mentioned about CERM, we brand ourselves as a translational institute to get the science into, uh, to the bench. Um, just want to clarify about then with that kind of blending, when we look at the five pillar of the funding distribution, is that having the impact of anything we prefer to fund or we still kind of across the board for all the five pillars? So I think that that is going to be the subject of uh, what Dr. Mbassiani had recommended that the science subcommittee lead a discussion um, in terms of prioritization, whether they be that by types of programs, by disease areas, or uh, program, other programmatic discussion. Um, the uh, CERM funding model and all of the infrastructure and everything we set up is adaptable to the direction, whether it be by priorities or programs, which is, you know, um, so I think we have a really, um, it's probably an opportune time, an important time, because Gil will probably tell you that there's been a huge influx of, um, of grant applications in all the pillars. So it's, it's a very timely to have that type of discussion at the board. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. Uh, Good morning and thank you for the presentation. Uh, just an operational question. So I appreciate all these efforts, you know, forward-looking sort of conversations, exploratory 
um, uh, conversations for new opportunities and new ways to expand CERM's impact in areas that we might have not been already. The question is, do you have provisions in the 23-24 budget that we're going to be looking at today for any of these sorts of conversations, you know, becoming, you know, getting to a conclusive program or a process or expanding existing program to accommodate the findings from this? Thank you very much. Um, regarding our ability with the, with the proposed 23-24 budget, to be able to um, accommodate, you know, direction from the board, for instance, or um, any um, opportunities that may arise from these discussions. Um, we do believe we have, just kind of looking at what those could look like, um, we do believe that within the pillar budgetary um, requests, those could be shaped to support some of the opportunities. And, and then we would bring, of course, the rationale behind that and what those that you know, the, the the shaping um, initiatives would be in upcoming meetings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I cannot think of a, a better scripted segue um, considering budget. I think that oh, Dr. Yamamoto. I'm sorry, Yamamoto. That's all right. It's fine. Uh, I just want to extend the uh, question and point that Steve Julesgard raised um, about the challenge that we're facing two points. The first is that the very fact that we are facing this problem is a credit to what CIRM has done. Um, uh, no one else has gotten us to the, gotten the, the country's attention to this problem uh, because nobody else has carried the ball far enough that we that it's really become evident. Um, and so, so while it's part of the problem statement now, uh, it should also be something that we recognize is a really unique contribution, one of many, but certainly a unique contribution that CERM is making. Uh, the second is that uh, I think at the end of the day, there's going to be nothing that can replace the federal government stepping in to carry the ball to the next step. And I think it's the, it's the reason I was really uh, happy to hear the, the chairman call for uh, CERM's uh, increased a presence on the federal government relations stage um, uh, to really uh, drive these messages home. So this is the first example, but one of many, if if CERM can continue to drive successes to this point where uh, the issue becomes really evident. Uh, you know, we, we all know that at the end of the day, there would have been no company that would have started manufacturing hundreds of millions of doses of this of the the, of, of the vaccine uh, before approval um, uh, without the government stepping in and saying here's a bunch of money go ahead and so making that bet and, and I think at the end of the day the government's going to have to make these kinds of bets and a part of it will be to um, recognize that what CERM is doing is is moving the ball to make these problems evident and doing it in a way that has a chance of being able to establish platform approaches that will be relevant to multiple diseases, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think if the federal government can recognize that, that there will increasingly be examples in which they will step in and say, okay, we'll, we'll should we carry the ball to the next enabling step. step. We, uh, com no company can take this on, but we're gonna enable it to happen. So I think that's probably how this problem is going to be solved. And it's a reason that CERM really needs to be in Washington making this point very strongly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, uh, tying together budget portfolio and um, funding um, to achieve our, our strategic goals, the board will now hear from Dr. Sombrano. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mbassiani, Dr. Milan. Um, it's always a privilege to, to stand before you and, and have the opportunity to present. And today I want to talk about uh, our CIRM funding model. And what we mean by that is what the process and the principles are that underlie this and how it is that we've gotten 
to develop the portfolio of grants that we currently have. And so I'm gonna talk uh, about that in a few uh, slides. Uh, you've seen this already. Uh, we know that everything that we fund at CERM is categorized within these five pillars of infrastructure, education, discovery, translation, and clinical. But we can look at these a little differently because they are intended to be connected and there are relationships among them that are very important to see. And uh, well, in some of these screens, you can see it better than in others, but the, the discovery translation and clinical pillars are connected along a therapeutic development pipeline. The idea behind this is that we want to support projects that come at any stage between generating a new idea and supporting a clinical trial that ultimately gets to an approved therapy, that a project can come in at any of these time points and um, move forward. We have also very specifically set up milestones along that path, so identified things such as achieving a single product candidate. So a discovery award would lead an applicant to achieve and characterize a candidate that then is the prerequisite for getting a translation award. The translation award would allow an applicant to move forward through, or an awardee, excuse me, through the stages of translation to achieve a pre-IND meeting or other pre-submission meeting. Um, and then that is the prerequisite for a clinical program. The idea behind this is that we've created the rungs on a ladder that allow a project to proceed in a um, appropriate way through this path. But then we also have our infrastructure programs, such as Alpha Clinics, let's say, that supports our clinical programs. So the Alpha Clinics provides uh, clinical trial support through clinical uh, trial coordination, through enrollment and recruitment help. And so that helps support the activities that happen in the clinical program. We have other infrastructure programs, such as the manufacturing, shared labs, and so on, that are intended to do the same thing. Um, we have our education program that provides, in many ways, the workforce that is utilized within all of the research programs that we have, but with the intent to create a diverse cohort of individuals that are also skilled and knowledge in cell and gene therapy. So looking at it this way, we see the, the connections uh, and can appreciate the relationships between them uh, a little better. The uh, funding opportunities that are tied then to each of these pillars uh, happen through a very specific application and review process, and I'll describe that uh, briefly. Everything that we issue requires uh, applicants to apply, to uh, submit a proposal to CIRM that we can look at and assess for merit. And so our funding opportunities uh, are um, described in what we call either a, a request for applications, an RFA, or a program announcement, uh, a PA. And so these documents provide all the requirements and all of the uh, necessary elements that are um, appropriate for that program, including what's eligible and what's not. And uh, just to give you a, a better sense of the, the two types of solicitations that we issue, one is a recurring funding opportunity, which we call program announcements. And so that usually is applied to our core research funding. The idea behind a recurring funding opportunity is that it is essentially the same opportunity that's available multiple times per year, and each cycle is largely the same as the previous one. And so one good example of that is our clinical program. The clinical program has 12 cycles that we run per year, and there's an application deadline at the end of every month. And so it is ongoing and continues to accept projects into um, our clinical program. We also have non-recurring funding opportunities, which we generally apply to those uh, opportunities that we may offer only once. So the Alpha Clinics Manufacturing Network are something that we will run once, hope to establish these programs, put them in place, but it is not an opportunity that we would necessarily 
uh, bring up again. Uh, we also do this for our education program simply because those uh, have a time span of about five years. We issue funding for a cohort of programs and we won't do it again for four or five years. And typically those are a little different each time we um, offer the opportunity. And so these, the, the recurring and non-recurring opportunities are both part of our toolkit that we currently use in order to make these solicitations uh, and um, get applications to come in. Now, regardless of the program type, what pillar it belongs to, um, it they all have to go through a very specific application and review process. Uh, and, and that is best described in this image, which is a three-step process. So applications that come to CIRM first go through an eligibility assessment. And the eligibility is done internally by the, the CIRM team. We look at very simple things, objective uh, criteria, if you will, of whether an application is complete, if it's a company, whether it's solvent, whether it meets the criteria that we have established in the PA or RFA for a therapeutic candidate. Um, and those that are appropriate and accepted for review then go on to the merit review, which is typically conducted by the grants working group. And so the grants working group's task is to assess the applications based on the scientific merit. And those criteria are laid out in our RFAs and PA so that it is clear to the applicants what it is the grants working group reviewers will look at. And beyond the scientific assessment, we also do, as you know, the DEI assessment at this stage. So our patient advocate members of our grants working group participate in uh, scoring for those that are translational and clinical applications or participating in discussion that helps us better assess the DEI elements as well. And then the, the outcome of these reviews is a recommendation to the CIRM board. Uh, in most cases, it is to the application review subcommittee that makes the final determination. But in some cases, such as with the AAWG, uh, the Access and Affordability Working Group, it is the full board. But the idea is these recommendations that are coming to the board are only part of the equation that the ICOC or the application review subcommittee may use in making that funding decision. So there's those recommendations, but there are also some team recommendations that may come to you. There are also public comment and other factors that may contribute to determining whether CIRM should fund a given project or set of projects. Uh, and part of that may be strategy, portfolio, other um, elements that come into play. And so these three steps is something that we utilize for all our programs. Now, what we fund, what actually comes in and goes through this process is largely determined by the mandate under Prop 71 and or Prop 14. And it's you know, pretty straightforward and simple, and I've actually attempted to summarize that in four bullets. The main one being research using stem and progenitor cells, and now under Prop 14, what we define as genetic therapies. And so that is, has been from the onset an important element. But also research that generally the NIH and the federal government do not support or does not support sufficiently. And so the, the case that we have made, even though it is true that NIH funds stem cell research, they certainly have regenerative medicine programs and research that involves stem cells, uh, is that we have a very unique funding model. So we tend to fund research at later stages, particularly that valley of death, the translational and clinical stages. We tend to support research uh, and activities that the federal government and NIH do not. And we also provide a level of support for awardees that generally is unprecedented in other funding agencies. Um, and so those are, are key elements that the, do distinguish us from NIH and the federal government. 
Uh, also importantly, part of our mandate is the development of therapies and cures. So all of our work, all of the research that we do, all of our programs are directed in some way uh, towards that goal. And now under Prop 14, to also make them affordable and accessible. And that's something that we still have to tackle. Uh, and then finally, something that we've talked about earlier today and, and in other meetings is the allocation that has been specifically set for diseases of the brain. And so how that is included and accounted for within the mandate is something that we will also continue to talk about. But other than that, there is no specific directive towards a specific disease, condition, uh, any uh, scientific disciplines that must be accounted for or any stage of research that we must take on. So there is still within our mandate quite a bit of flexibility in what we do. And I'll show you one more slide as it relates to the scope of what it is that we do, just because it's, it's a good example of how it is that we determine what comes in as an application. And oftentimes this relates to the, the support of different therapeutic candidate types. So over the years, this has changed a little bit here and there, but generally we have supported cell therapies where a stem or progenitor cell is a component of that therapy or is used to manufacture it. We also, beyond the actual cell therapy, which is what most people think about with regenerative medicine, are small molecules or biologics. So these are just small molecule drugs that act on a stem cell, whether it's an endogenous stem cell or a cancer stem cell to exert a, a therapeutic effect. We also allow for, um, for example, uh, any, any biologic that can modify a stem cell therapy, so an imaging agent, for example, or where a stem cell is necessary to manufacture it. So these are uh, extracellular vesicles, for example, that can be generated. So all of those different types of therapeutic candidates and modalities qualify for CERM funding. So it is a pretty broad window. And now under Prop 14, we have also added the genetic therapy. And so this we have defined quite broadly as well. This is beyond just the gene therapy that many people know, which is encompassed under anything that alters the genomic sequence of cells. It is also any therapeutic that introduces or directly manipulates nucleic acids. So now we have mRNAs, antisense oligos, and so on that are part of the scope of what we can fund. And so all of this background I'm giving to you is part of a, a way of uh, informing you of what it is that we do, but also hoping to inspire you to think about as we move forward uh, and think about prioritization, how that model that we have been using either could be tweaked, changed, uh, modified, or continue to be used in a way that uh, is better focused on us accomplishing our mission. So towards that end, there's a series of questions that I'll go over very briefly, but are not intended for us to uh, discuss here, but maybe are an inspiration for what the Science Subcommittee and Dr. Ambassiani was requesting uh, that could be taken on. And one of the most important questions is, how is it that CERN can make the greatest impact on its mission? Now, this is this question, as well as all these other questions that I'm going to go through, are ones that we're not just asking now. We've been asking these all along the way. Um, this has been essential in developing the strategic plan that we have, as well as the strategic plans that we have that have come before that. But it is something that is an ongoing process. We need to continuously be asking these questions to see whether we are still on task. And so uh, how is it that we can make the greatest impact? We have a very generous amount of funds to work with, but it's also not unlimited. And so how we choose to focus and bring that together in order to make an impact 
is a key question. How narrow or how broad should our portfolio be as it relates to different elements? Disease representation, for example, is one that often comes up. Should we seek to have as many diseases as possible represented within our portfolio, or is it okay to maybe focus in on those that are most likely to, to be impacted by cell and gene therapy approaches? Qualifying candidates. As I showed you, we have a very broad array of what qualifies for some funding. In some cases, the line can get a little bit blurry even at the eligibility stage. For example, what determines what is a cancer stem cell? And even in the field, it isn't always accepted that a given cell type is a cancer stem cell or what may be a progenitor cell or what should be incorporated within the definition of a genetic therapy. I mean, we created a definition, but that can change depending on what we think our priorities might be. Or how do we address having similar therapeutic approaches? CAR-T comes up as an example because we see that a lot. Uh, that comes up quite often, but there are others. Um, is it okay to take on the same approach? And you know, how many projects are sufficient to say that we've covered that arena? Which leads to the next question, how much funding support is actually necessary within a given therapeutic approach or within a stage of research or a disease for us to have a meaningful impact. And that is important because there may be cases where we may have only two projects in a given disease area or that use an approach. How much of an impact over our timeframe will that make? And then lastly, what is or what are the most important outcomes for CIRM in 10 years? Looking into the future and thinking of what we'd like to accomplish, where we would like to be, what would we have to do today in order to accomplish those elements? And again, these are, are questions not for today, but hopefully to inspire your thinking. and. Um, Hopefully that it, it does. So that is my presentation and I thank you very much. Oh, oh, just, yeah. I, all right, we're gonna start with Leandra. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. And I know you said the questions aren't for today, but I'm I'm dying to to have a <laughs> okay. few comments. Is that okay? Is that out of order? Um you know, I love the slide that you had that reminded us of our scope. And I think one of the strengths of CIRM is the ability to go outside what's typically funded and, and typically supported. I think that just leads to diversity and, and thought and innovation. And that's really, I think, a value of CIRM. Um, and in line with that, your question around, should we stay narrow? Should we go broad? I know, you know, going narrow may seem more focused, right? Um, and strategic in some ways, but I think the ability to stay broad in some ways does correlate with the scope of going outside, thinking outside the box and, and, and innovation in different ways and also really uh, valuing the diversity. Um, I think about the stories um, that were shared this morning uh, by uh, Maria and the fact that these innovations were supported, right? And continue to be supported. So I, I would hate to do something that would potentially put us in a space where we're not able to fund something that comes up that is really innovative and important uh, work. And so I would, even though you didn't ask for questions <laughs> and responses right now, I really am leaning towards and leaning into what's atypical, which is being pretty broad and open to um, the diversity of different um, approaches. So wanted to share that. And then in 10 years, um, I really do hope that we're able to say that we did that, right? That just today, as folks are reporting on the wonderful things that we did because we stepped outside the box, I want to be able to say that in 10 years as well. So unsolicited input. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think next is uh, member Julius. Thank you, we're all going to agree. Probably not all, I shouldn't say that, but I do agree. Uh, great presentation. Can you give us a few examples of some of the challenges 
that the CERM team has already faced when reviewing the application initially, you know, the first screen before it goes to GWG, and specifically about the definition, not so much about the quality, but the definition. And your second point here, how has the team addressed that, faced that? Because it's a yeah. real challenge. You really eloquently described how deficiency can be blurrier than what we think. That's right. It, it is... It continues to be challenging because it seems anywhere we try to draw a line, there is always going to be a project that just straddles that line. And, and what we do is, is we have group discussions about these and we, we attempt to be consistent in our interpretation. And so we make sure that if we say, okay, well, something that was straddling the line that we decided was eligible, that if we see anything that looks like that again, that we treat it the same way. And it does take effort and time. And I think that's the challenge. In an ideal world, we would like to, to have a very clear delineation that allows us to say, okay, this project is in, this project is out, but it just has been the case that it, it's not that easy. Um, and you know, for some things, it is simple. But where a field continues to move and evolve and definitions within a field change and opinions change, um, it is sort of a moving target that we just have to keep up with. Um, and I'm not sure, other than what we're doing, what else we, we can do. I was asking if you have one or two specific examples. Oh, I'm sorry. Or just, yes. just... Yeah, so, so the ones that, yes, the ones that often, um, you know, come up are um, a small molecule that targets a cancer stem cell of some type. And, you know, there we often look to see, is there evidence that this tumor type actually involves or has cancer cells? What data does the applicant provide and show to say that they have uh, an actual cancer st stem cell that they are targeting? Um, so that's one example of what we do. It, and it's similar with progenitor cells. Some, sometimes uh, in certain disciplines, somebody identifies an endogenous stem cell type that arguably may or may not be one. We also have a very broad definition of what a progenitor is. The, the qualifier is that it must um, be not a completely mature cell and that it has the capacity to divide. And there are cells that maybe in the field, uh, it would not be accepted as a progenitor, but it still meets the definition. So in some cases, we would allow it. Mm -hmm. Member Yamamoto. So stepping back from the, these challenges of having to make choices about specific disease areas or projects, I think one of the striking things about what CIRM has done historically is the balance that it, it has really exercised in supporting the different research approaches. Um, uh, you know, I don't think there's any, any reason to try to be slavish about this. Different kinds of research cost different amounts of money. But nevertheless, it is really interesting, as, as Maria showed in one of her graphics, that historically, CIRM has really um, uh, supported uh, basic research, translational and clinical, um, uh, really across the board, robustly. Um, uh, that's not true in the in the recent expenditures. I think that was the other striking thing that I took away from that slide is that in the really recent history, what we've seen is a much stronger uh, low level support in terms of dollars uh, that have gone to clinical research. I'm assuming that's not doesn't represent a trend or a decision. Uh, it's just a point in time. Uh, but if you could speak to that point uh, specifically, I think it would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, it, in many ways, it, it you know the, the the demand, if you will, that is out there, as was mentioned, ha has increased overall for all projects. But um, as you also indicated, for some projects, it's greater costs, particularly when you're looking at at clinical trials. So we we are faced with the question of you know how much can CERM actually handle when we deal with this demand. In some areas, it, it is you know, a, a reasonable amount. We have mechanisms in place to do it, but we 
have a continually growing number of applications that continue to come to us that would benefit from us having a better understanding of what we want to either prioritize as we've been talking about or you know choose to fund over others because the 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 it's not an issue of merit where i think where we started it was let the science determine what we fund because the merit alone was enough to keep the the number of projects and the amount of funds that we would issue to them to be aligned now we may be getting to a point where the number of meritorious projects exceeds what we may want to actually expend on an annual basis and so then comes the question of then which ones do we choose and among a set of all meritorious projects which ones are the most likely to help us achieve our mission or have an impact um and so i i, I mean i kind of twirled around trying to answer your question but but it it, it maybe gives a little context as to how we're thinking about it in terms of, of that that perspective thank you um so member jules card and then we'll just continue around the table now thanks again Gil, for the presentation so the last slide posed four strategic questions i assume the reason for posing the questions is to develop answers and those answers will be discussed here in this room at, or a room like this at some point. Mm -hmm. I want to focus for a moment on the third one because that's the one that, for me anyway, based upon being on the neuro task force and some of the things that we've heard, particularly anecdotally, is whether we have enough funding support. So our funding support, if you go back, you know, I look back what in 2016, I think the award levels were the same in 2016 as they are today. We haven't changed the amount of awards we're making and yet I'm sure many of us are aware of the of the impact of inflation, and particularly more recently. Uh, and so, is there uh, how much thought is being given to really look uh, at our funding levels? And I and this follows Dr. Yamamoto's question, particularly uh, in the area of discovery and of translational work, to say whether or not they're sufficient. And even in with specific areas, the anecdotal issue I referred to is neuropsychiatric research, which involves a lot of genetic research, which is not simple and not inexpensive. And so anyway, uh, I'm just hopeful that we take a, a, a good look at that and, and whether we ought to think about making some changes, at least in some specific areas. Right. Thank you. Yes, yes. And we, we, we are specifically looking at the um, the budget caps that we have for each of the programs to ensure that they're they're appropriate. Um, but as you know, there is quite a bit of variability among projects and, and the, the different activities that they conduct that in some cases justify a greater amount and in other cases, maybe not. Thank you, Gil. Um, Member Barrett. Yes, thank you, Gil, very much for your presentation. Um, I really wanted in some ways to echo what Leandra said, that it is important within the constraints of, of what the agency was set up to do to remain as broad as possible, because history has shown us that we are pretty foolish if we think that we can truly predict what is going to be the most impactful. Um, letting things bubble up from the scientific community, making sure that we do continue to support discovery research, even though the impact of that may be a long way down the road and perhaps beyond many of our lifespans um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be supporting it. So um, a balance between the quick wins and the blue sky research that may be extremely impactful if judged to be highly meritorious. So, um, but I do not personally see other than the constraints of the proposition legislation, that we should be targeting specific disease states. Um, there is a lot of suffering to go about. I'll take that as a comment rather than a question. So Member Southern. I also wanted to build on the remarks already made about the things that we've been talking about in the neuro uh, task force, particularly on neuropsych, where it's clearly an area that uh, we hear we don't get proposals because the proposals would to do real 
action would be very expensive, and yet they're at the very beginning stages. So uh, in the 10-year area, I would hope that we're able to at least begin to start to make an effect on the, the uh, issues of severe mental illness and addiction as one of the things that becomes our hallmark. That, that would be the hope of many of us here. Thank you very much. Any other comment in the room? Yes. Vice Chair? I also wanted to comment on capacity for our review team and how many reviews we can have a year. That really also determines um, how much money is is put out in different um, in different areas. So it also, you know, for discovery, how many rounds do we have of discovery a year versus how many rounds do we have of CLIN versus how many rounds we have of translation? So that's also something to take into consideration, Keith, um, with your question. Um, so it's not just dollars allocated, but it's what the capacity is and, and what the board thinks is, is, is best. Uh, Gil, you said it's not always easy, but I think that's what CIRM is all about. It is a maverick. It was, you know, it was made to be exist because the feds wouldn't do it. And so we're, we're always reaching higher than perhaps people think is reasonable or we're, we're, think, we're shooting for the stars here. We're shooting for hopes and dreams of people who are ill, as uh, Kim said, you know, every, to every person who's ill looking for uh, an answer. Uh, this is what we're about. So I don't, I never, I always want to do risk and I always want to shoot as high as we can. And yes, there are reasonable people who might help us keep some feet on the ground. But I think that what CIRM is all about is about uh, shooting for the highest and get, hoping for the best results we can get. And, and then leading, helping lead the science. And so uh, I'm not for clipping wings, I'm for adding <laughs> new opportunity. So thank you. But perhaps in a, within the work we've already done, they're starting to show us some answers that we could look at to, uh, to see, you know, what are the good outcomes, how long it takes to get to these good outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. So we could start there with some baseline data. Thank you, board members, for your comments and questions. Gil, thank you very much for yeah, this um, great presentation. I have a feeling when the board discusses this topic in the months and months <laughs> to come, they're going to they're going to refer back. Remember what Gil said on July, on June 29th? Um, so this was um, uh, very important for us to hear. And I think important for board members, regardless of how many years of, of tenure on the board, or especially if you're new, to have had a, a really fundamental review of our whole funding process. So it was a, a double whammy. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to um, do one more thing and, and proceed to the consent calendar, and then we'll take a short break. Oh. Yeah, yes, we're going to take one because I, I, I don't think that um, before we go to the consent, uh, let me add an addendum to the chair's report. I started by saying I had toured the state and visited six of our nine uh, alpha clinics. And then when I was done speaking, I only ticked off five on my fingers. I credit it to the nervousness of a maiden voyage, if you will. I think I left out one, and I think it was UC Irvine. I did not mean uh, to slight anyone by oversight, so I apologize. But um, the reception there was equal in enthusiasm and completeness as all the others. So thank you. Um, so the consent calendar, you know how this works. Um, this is something the uh, board leadership has uh, determined. It probably contains non-controversial items which can be voted on um, unless anyone at the table or any board member, whether you're here in the room or not, has an issue with anyone, then you would need to excerpt it. And uh, if you do take it out of consent, we will discuss uh, the reasons why you want to consider it separately at a slightly later point in the agenda. Um, so understanding that, I would like to, um, to know, are there any, uh, does any board member um, have any desire to remove any item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I would like a motion and a second to approve all the remaining items on the consent calendar, which are all of them. So and moved. Second. We have a move and a second. So um, 
is there any public comment on this before we proceed to a vote? Okay. Then, Scott, I can go to a vote then, I presume. All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, say nay. Scott, would you take a roll call of those members on the phone? Yes. Haifa Abdul Haq? Yes. Sorry, Haifa, you may be muted. Yes. I'll come back. Dan Bernal? <laughs> and Dan, I think you're muted as well. I'll come back. George Blumenthal? Yes. I know. See, I'm moving. And George just. <laughs> uh, Linda Boxer. Yes. Thank you. Fred Fisher. Fred. He's muted. Judy Gasson. Yes. Thank you. Larry Goldstein. Yes. Rich Lahara. Yes. David Lowe. Yes. Christine Miaskowski. Yes. Michael Stamos. Yes. And I'll call the others again. Haifa. Yes. Thank you. Dan Bernal. Fred Fisher. The motion carries. Thank Thanks you. very much. Okay. Um, the board will now enjoy a short recess.
I think we are about to um, convene back into regular order here. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, Chair's discretion, because of uh, some of the exigencies of some of our board members, I'm going to move up item number 12 in the agenda. Every Everything else will keep its order. Um, this is the consideration uh, from the governance uh, subcommittee. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Levitt to my left to take it from here. I was going to ask uh, Dr. Gasson on my right to do it, but she's <laughs> she's not here. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and you're silenced as well. <laughs> so let me uh, um, let me preface this with a few remarks about the the process. This is. Um, to take up the uh, the core of the of the review of the president and CEO, um, and and you had in your in your briefing book the the survey, which will be the item to vote on. Uh, just to preface, um, um, the governance subcommittee met in, uh, June nineteenth. Uh, prior to June nineteenth, the the um, the board. Um, uh, chair and vice chair and the and the and the co-chairs of the governance committee uh, met to discuss a process that we would use for the retrospective um, as, um, assessment of of uh, Dr. Milan that would encompass uh, FY twenty three. So this is a, a retrospective review. I do want to say that we've had really productive conversations. Um, about uh, the governance committee taking up um, um, after this review to review the process of the review and to work with the president and CEO and the, and the chair and vice chair of the, the board about uh, modifying the process in a, in a very productive way. So we've had some very exciting conversations. And speaking on behalf of the governance subcommittee, I think they're excited about this as well. Hopefully I'm not over... I'm not exaggerating, right? Yeah. Maria is very excited yeah. about this. Um, and so um, uh, um, the review uh, uh, period, I've already mentioned the, the stakeholders that are going to complete the survey, the board chair and vice chair, the co-chairs of governance, the co-chairs of the other board subcommittees, and the direct reports, the president and CEO. Um, uh, there was there was an independent consultant who was engaged, uh, Susan White, uh, to uh, look at the, the the decision was made to bring to the governance subcommittee, essentially the same survey that was done um, in the last review with some minor modifications that were uh, made. Um, it's not a 360. I want to point that out. It's a it's a it's a it's a survey, and we're going to take up the. Um, a, a number of these um, issues, um, probably um, around September. So we had the subcommittee meeting to discuss the process survey and the timeline, um, and, uh, and, and that was all approved. The process involves the survey. It also involves um, virtual individual interviews, the board chair and vice chair, the, and the, the co-chairs of the Many subcommittees for this for this board, um, and then some of the direct reports. They were invited to do a virtual in, 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 in interview. I I think it's up to them to to do that. There'll be um, uh, the same. If you've read it before this meeting, the competency areas, the review areas. Um, uh, we're having this meeting today on on the 29th to uh, to approve that that survey. Uh, the board chair uh, will communicate to the, to Dr. Milan, the board, and the direct reports to introduce um, Susan White as the the independent consultant. Um, there'll be an email that gets sent out um, July 11th with requests for response by the 25th. Given that Dr. Yamamoto is always late, we're going to add another day or two to make sure that you get your survey in. Uh, that was just spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> Most basic scientists are always late. Absolutely. This will be a late response window. And then um, the, the consultant will, you asked me to do this, right? 
the, the consultant um, will compile uh, the results, uh, create a performance review summary. Uh, written performance summary will go to the board chair and vice chair and the governance committee's co-chairs. Um, um, Susan White will be available to meet with us to discuss the performance summary sometime in August, likely. And then um, uh, the, there'll be a board meeting in September in which performance review summary will be discussed. So that's the timeline. Judy, did I leave anything critical out? You did not. It was perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Tell my family that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear that. Yeah, no, I never hear that. Uh, so um, uh, I think that was my preface that um, I'm not, we're, we're not going to review the questions, right? We have to have a motion uh, in order to then, and a second in order to discuss, right? That's right. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, may I have a motion to approve the form recommended for approval um, by the governance subcommittee? So moved. Second. And we have a second. Um, so comments from the board. once um is there any public comment on this topic there are no no public comments N there are no comments all right so uh, okay uh, all those in favor of this recommendation from the governance subcommittee please say aye aye, aye. 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 those opposed say no nay scott will you then please poll the people on the line thank you thank you haifa abdul haq yes thank you dan bernal Aye. George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Boxer? Yes. Fred Fisher? Aye. Judy Gasson? Yes. Larry Goldstein? Yes. Rich Lahara? Yes. David Loeb? Aye. Christine Miaskowski? Yes. And Michael Stamos? Yes. Michael? Great. Thank you very much. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Tosher. Um, okay, we're gonna move on now to regular order here. Uh, item number 10, we have two budget items to consider today. This is the first, consideration of CIRM's administrative budget for fiscal year 23-24. I'm gonna invite uh, Pune Simpson to present the administrative budget. Morning, Chair and board members. Um, I am Pune Simpson, the Senior Director of Finance, and like the Chair said, I will be making two presentations today. The first will be the administrative budget, and in our presentations, we always start with our mission. As Dr. Milan said, our mission is the North Star, and we've built our budget based on the mission and our goals for this next year. To go over the agenda for the first presentation, I'm going to add something that I hadn't in previous years, which is a overview of Prop 14. Then I will share with you where we're at in this fiscal year, fiscal year 22-23, and then present the 23-24 proposed budget for your approval. So to start with the overview of Prop 14, we have shown in this graph everything that's in that $5.5 million proposition, and we've broken it out into four different buckets. The largest bucket being the research at $4.9 billion. The discussion on that bucket will be later in the second presentation. The other three buckets are the grant administration and compliance, which equal $320 million, the administration and overhead, which is $192.5 million, and a bucket that's controlled by the treasurer's office for the sale of our bonds for $100 million. So I wanna break out the three buckets on the right in the next slide and um, show you where we're at as, as it relates to expenditures in the last three years that we have been operating with Prop 14 funds. So the largest of those is the 3.5% that's allowed for general administration. The other three buckets that I had com combined into um, grant administration and compliance are really three uh, individual sections called out in the proposition. The first being 3% for grant administration, the second being 1% for access and affordability, and the last being a pot of $100 million set aside for grant compliance. And finally, the 100 million that the treasurer's office controls. So 
Having shared that overview of the proposition and where the administrative buckets are, I want to talk about where we've been in this fiscal year, in fiscal year 22-23. So this was another year of ramping up for us, and we increased our staffing levels due to the increased workload. As a result of the hard work of our HR experts and the leadership team, we welcomed 16 new members um, that are um, talented and have been contributing to the new missions of our organization. We still have four positions in recruitment, one of which will likely get filled this fiscal year. So we will be requesting three in, in my presentation later when we talk about the 23-24 budget. And the reason we do that is if positions are left with vacant, we, we evaluate their need and whether we need to continue them or return the funds um, to the big bucket. So you will see those three in a few slides. We also completed our move to the South San Francisco office and we've had partial resumption of our travel and pre-pandemic activities that have shaped some of the expenditures for this fiscal year. In the next chart, we kind of summarize what the budget was, uh, how, what it was approved by the board and how much we spent. So in the second column, we had a budget approved by the ICOC of $26.2 million. We estimate that we're gonna finish this year at $21.7 million. And the variance is 4.5 million. I wanna talk a little bit about that variance in the next few slides and explain some of the factors that contributed to it. But before I move on, I wanted to remind everybody, funds not spent in a given year are not lost. They're returned to the big bucket of available funds for future use. There were four categories that contributed to that $4.5 million variance. The largest one being employee expense. We were under budget by 3 million, and that was mainly because of the delays in hiring those 16 positions and the four vacant ones that are still being worked on actively some staff turnover and some trans, um, transit and per diem savings. We had budgeted more than what actually happened. We also had savings in the area of reviews, meetings, and workshops. We were under budget by $551,000. This was primarily because in-person meetings became virtual or were postponed. We had some savings in office expenses, and um, that had to do with some of our move costs being low, lower due to the diligent work of the staff to bring in competitive bids for the various aspects of our move. Finally, we had some savings in rent because we had we didn't move into this building until the fifth year of the fiscal year, the fifth month of the fiscal year. So we had a savings of six hundred thousand dollars. Altogether, these cost savings are a result of the hard work of the team managing expenses and keeping costs down while addressing the changing needs of our program. I wanna talk a little bit more about employee expenses because it is a large number and I wanna break that down a little bit more. The vacancies and the delayed in, uh, hiring attributed to 2.3 million of the variance that we had. A lot of those positions are filled now. So when I present the 23, 24 budget, I'm accounting for the full year cost now that they're on board but I had to show the savings here because it was dollars not spent. There was also some underutilization of temp help and um, the actuals for a patient advocate board member per diem coming in lower than we had budgeted. Finally, I mentioned the transit savings. So altogether, there was a $3 million um, variance between what we had requested and what we had spent. And this $3 million is going to come up in a later slide. So I want you to remember that because it'll come up when we talk about the 23-24 budget. I also wanted to point out the higher expenses. So there was lots of savings in different categories. There was a category where we had higher expenses. So um, this had to do with external services. And there's two reasons why we had higher expenses in this category. The first was we needed consultants for some of our new initiatives. They included the IP and industry activities for business development, the roadmap discussion for access and affordability, the facilities working group consultant to help us get those grants underway. And finally, in finance, we had a consultant that helped us with the automation of financial processes. There was also another reason for this increase, and it had to do with the correction we made in the budget. We felt there were some items in office expenses that were more accurate 
as a pre, uh, presented as external services. They were more contracts than they were services. So we moved them up. And an example is a contract for 225,000, um, which was for the diagrams and the consulting for our AV system. So altogether, there was an increase here of 535, but we showed the savings in office expenses and were able to manage the overall budget within what the, what the board had approved. Having summarized what we did in 22-23, I wanna move on to 23-24 and uh, talk about what we're asking for. In the second column, I again present to you what the board approved in 22-23, and in the third column, the estimate to finish that we just looked at. In the fourth column, I present the 23-24 uh, proposed budget for administration. Right off the bat, the top number, $19.7 million. Again, that's the full year cost of all the positions that were approved and filled this year, plus the uh, additional positions I will be requesting in a few slides. Altogether, we're asking for a budget of $28.9 million in fiscal year 23-24. And we always show you the comparison of what we're asking for versus what we spent this year. So the last column, the $7.2 million, is the difference between what we're asking for next year versus what we actually think we spent this year. So I'm gonna dig into that $7.2 million a little bit and mainly focus on the top three categories, which are the largest dollar amounts. Those three categories are employee expense. It has to do with nine additional positions. Remember, three are in recruitment now. So really, we're asking for six new positions and the continuation of three that are in recruitment. Some um, additional reviews, meetings, and workshops that will take place in person, which is a higher cost than uh, virtual. And then some membership and training both because we have increased number of staff and because we're, we're resuming the pre-pandemic levels of activity. So to dig in a little bit more into the employee costs, which are the largest component of, uh, of the budget, we're requesting nine new positions, which equals $1.6 million. We're also accounting for a salary, um, salary increase called a performance-based merit salary increase. This is budgeted at 3%. So the budget includes $290,000 for a merit increase for those who are eligible for it. I have not budgeted anything for cost of living, um, so nothing in the budget for that. And there's also been a, an adjustment here where we um, have to adjust the con contributions to retirement was at 34% and it's been decreased to 33%. This is set by the control agencies. It's not anything we control, but it resulted in a savings. So the net impact is $4.5 million, 3 million being the savings from last year, which I showed you in a few, a few slides ago, and then the 1.4 million increase this year. The next uh, slide goes into the next category where we had a high variance external services. There was some one-time consulting that I mentioned um, needed to develop our new initiatives and programs. There was a, some contingent contracts in place for the move, which we now can take out of our budget because we have moved and, and don't need those contingent contracts anymore. And also there was that realignment where we're trying to show services under external services versus other categories. So this uh, attributed to $996,000 between what we spent this year and what we anticipate spending next year. Finally, in the last category, which is reviews, meetings, and workshops, we had higher cost of reviews. We're increasing to five in-person meetings versus the virtual ones we were having. We are continuing our scientific workshops and advisory meetings, and we're continuing the clinical and translational advisory panels. So the difference between what we spent this year and what we're asking for next year is $845,000. In building the budget, we try to actively manage all of the, the aspects of the budget, but there are things that are outside our control. Those include recruitment and personnel growth, economic instability, and post-pandemic recovery of meetings, travel, and um, work activities. With those constraints, we have prepared the budget of 28.9 million that we're asking the board to approve. 
So I can stop here and take any questions before the vote. Um, before we go to questions, may I have a motion to approve the form recommended by the, go I, I'm sorry, by the, um, where was I? Finance. Yeah, by the Finance Committee. And a second, please. Move. We have a movement in a second. Okay. So. Okay. Are there uh, any board comment? Wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mohammed, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Puna, for the very clear material and very clear and succinct presentation. I have one question regarding cost of living. So you don't have in the budget, I'm assuming what I understood, you don't have a provision for right. cost of living increase. But it is a fact, inflation is an actual you know, matter. And state agencies, a number of state agencies are expected to have raises for cost of living over the next few you know, months retro to July 1st, just based on the dynamics and what's going on. So can you just speak to why not having at least a provision in there in case you need it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So the governor negotiates um, the cost of living adjustment percentage with the different bargaining units. We are all exempt employees at SARM. We have no bargaining, but we do um, follow what the governor recommends as a cost of living adjustment. Because that hasn't been determined, we didn't want to put any money in the budget for it. Um, again, par partially because we're trying to put things in the budget that we're not sure might materialize, which leads to those really big variance gaps of what we spent versus what we're asking. For. So um, nothing has been put in the budget, but should the governor approve a cost of living adjustment, we will evaluate it and decide if it, if it is something that SORM wants to include in our budget. We will address that either by redirecting savings if we have any in the fiscal year where that adjustment will take place, or we will come back to the board if we don't have enough funds and ask for those dollars. Thank you. Member Juleskart is next, followed by um, Member Hagen. Okay, um, David. Well, I'm going to ask, ask uh, I think, a very good question uh, about uh, if this number changes. So I think I'm just going to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, he, uh, he said that Mohammed asked his question. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, any other board comment? Is there any public comment on the 23-24 budget? No public comment. None. Okay, then we're going to vote on um, CIRM's... That's getting... Okay. At the bottom of your computer. Mr. Tosher is clearly pluripotent in his abilities. Um, okay, then uh, we're going to move to a vote on accepting the budget for the next uh, fiscal year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed say nay. No opposition. Scott, would you please take a member uh, roll of, of the members on the phone? Yes. Haifa Abdul Haq. Yes. Dan Bernal. Aye. George Blumenthal. Yes. Linda Boxer. Yes. Fred Fisher. Yes. Judy Gasson. Yes. Larry Goldstein. Yes. Rich Lahara. Yes. David Lowe. Yes. Chris Miaskowski. Yes. And Michael Stamos. Yes. Great. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Vito. Thank you very much. So we're going to now move. To Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Mr. Chair. Over Thank here. you. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Member Duran. I should get that. Oops, there, I almost dropped my coffee. Uh, I just wanted to comment because I'd asked this last year. I hope it's being considered um, concern about having a robust, decent comms budget. Uh, after all, we're now promoting new issues, new activities, new opportunities for our diverse communities to engage. And that takes a real uh, lift for our comms team. 
to make sure that they're well supported, they have enough people to do the work, and we're outreaching in the multiple ways one needs to in order to get the message out and to engage not just our Bridges teams and our Sparks kids and so on and so forth, but to make sure that our public is really beginning to hear, see, and know what the heck we're all about. And so uh, I just really want to continue to support that somehow or another built within this is a decent amount of dollars for our comms team. And welcome aboard, Corin, who's just in the back of the room. Sorry, to Mr. Chair, didn't mean to steal any thunder here, but I just want to say, welcome, Corin. No, <laughs> certainly constant with one of my uh, uh, imperatives, if you will. Um, I certainly support your comment, and I don't think there's a worry on that, right? <laughs> I don't think it's called out as a separate line item, but <clears throat> but it's mm -mm. okay. Finance can take that under under advisement. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Uh, so please, uh, Ms. Simpson, stay there at the podium. We're going to consider the CIRM scientific research budget for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. So may I have a motion to approve the form recommended in your packet by the finance subcommittee and a second. We had member Higgins uh, has moved it. Member Yamamoto has seconded. Kune, you may yeah, proceed. So uh, to present the research budget, we brought back a couple of slides that you may have uh, remember seeing in the pre-pandemic era, pre-Prop 14 era. So this is to summarize the 5.5 billion of Prop 14 again. And so to call out what is um, in the research bucket, the 4.9 billion. So on the next slide, I break out that research bucket into committed and uncommitted. So far, the board has committed $811.4 million of the research bucket. And so today I'm gonna to be presenting the 23-24 budget for additional commitments in the future for research. To go over the agenda, I will tell you um, where we're at with this year, with what the board approved and what we've been able to do with it before presenting the 23-24 budget for your approval. So in 22-23, in this chart, we summarize the amount that the board approved, $426.7 million. The, Board has been very busy in committing grants to various projects. And in total, we have committed $293.6 million. There's pending commitments of 26.2 million. And this has to do with the timing of how we put our grants out. Some of them can't fit in the calendar before June 30th and fall into subsequent months. This is actually something that we are uh, proposing a change to in fiscal year 23-24, which I will talk about in a few slides. So the combined estimated to finish commitments in research will be $330.4 million this year with a savings of $96.3 million. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, cat, the largest category of savings there, so the $70 million. This is uh, mostly attributed to the um, uh, our inability to find a contractor quickly enough for the facilities working group and some delays that came from that uh, for the shared labs. We now have the contractor in place and they will help us with designing the review requirements for the applications that we will be reviewing. So moving on to the 23-24 budget, there are some major drivers that have led to the budget we're proposing. We plan on having 18 grants working groups, one facilities working group, one access and affordability working group um, in a 12 month period. We will continue funding our discovery, translational and clinical pillars when we will continue funding conference grants in the education pillar. We have some new initiatives that we're proposing this year, which include the shared labs, the access and affordability in the patient support program, and the DISC neuro concept, which will be presented in the fall of this coming year. So to, to dig a little bit deeper into our methodology by pillar, um, I wanna start by saying that when we prepare the research budget, we wanna make sure there's enough funding so that if our performance in a given year is the same as previous years, that we have the funds available for the board so that they can make um, commitments. 
So with regards to the clinical budget, we have a new paradigm this year with increases in the volume of applications. This is primarily due to two things, the successful recruitment of grantees and also the change in the economy. So we're requesting $252 million, which is based on the maximum number of awards funded in a year times the average award amount. And this base has been now adjusted to reflect the high that we had in fiscal year 22-23. For translational budget, we're requesting $84.6 million. This is based on the average number of awards funded per review times the number of reviews times the average amount. We arrive at this methodology based on the input we get from the staff. And um, this also includes an increase of two extra grants going out in 23-24. For the discovery budget, we initially requested $62.5 million, but in a later slide, I want to come back to this because we have some additional numbers that we want to update you on. With regards to education, we're going to continue with $2.5 million in um, funding for conference grants. And finally, in the category of infrastructure, we're requesting $62.5 million to cover the shared labs, the patient support grants, and the manufacturing potential for a possible resubmission of applications. In a situation where the grants, uh, where performance exceeds our budget, we can always come back to the board as part of a mid-year budget to request additional funds so that all meritorious grants and uh, needs out there are met. Up to now, um, the budget included um, the start of all of our initiatives, but not necessarily when that initiative would be presented uh, for award. So an initiative might have started mid-year and it would spill into the following year because of the calendaring of the review and award process. One of the fiscal changes we're proposing is starting in fiscal year 23-24, all the requests in all the pillars that we're presenting will be committed in that fiscal year. So barring any unforeseen circumstances, all the funds we're asking for in this next fiscal year will actually come to the board for a decision before June 30th. This next um, slide is what I presented to the science subcommittee. And since then, we've had additional um, information that is adjusting the, the total ask. So the following slide is, shows the adjustment that we're going to be asking for. So in the last neuro task force, the CIRM staff was asked to reevaluate the grant amounts for um, the uh, discovery program. And so for that reason, we had been proposing a reduction in discovery of $22.2 million. But now we've revised our request and are asking that you allow us to stay at that $84.7 million that was approved in 2223, so that there won't be any changes from this fiscal year to next in that category. As a result, we're asking for a total of $486.3 million for the 23-24 fiscal year. And that is the presentation. Uh, I'm asking for approval for that amount. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take it. Now proceed to board questions and comments. Kibert. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. If I'm reading the numbers right, in 22-23, there was a significant underspend in the discovery category of around 20, 20 plus million. That was actually a result of a postponement of one of our awards. So it was just postponed out. Okay, so, but you were budgeted last year for a hundred million. And even with the increase of 22.2 .2 million, you would still only go up to 84. That's correct. That's what we're asking for. So that does re reflect an overall reduction in investment in the discovery category. And apropos of the conversation that we had earlier with Gil about um, the having to prioritize and have uh, having more meritorious applications than can be supported, um, I wondered whether that was perhaps short-sighted. My colleague uh, will address that question. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, the, there are two reasons. Uh, so you you have actually very correctly identified. $22 million that was one of the 
discovery that due to capacity from review and also from staff, as you can see, we were not able to hire on time. Um, we had to remove one of the calls. Also, we were developing new initiatives, so we were being very mindful. Um, the second reason was that we uh, accounted for one of the DISC twos from last year in the budget of 22, 23, but it had actually come in 2021. So we had the review, but we accounted it. Uh, we had paid for it already in the year before. And that was a fiscal year accounting timeline mistake that we made um, as new LT, we didn't realize. So that was the reason, but we had the amount of uh, the three reviews actually. Uh, so hopefully that answers. And then in terms of, if I may be allowed just to follow up, I think this must be carefully messaged because the community will see this as a reduction in support for discovery grants. Thank you. We will. Okay, further comments or questions from the board? Member Sard. In this area of discovery, I think it's really important for us to take, keep our eye on it for the midterm budget adjustment, because if we're successful in doing the seek and find for the, the, the neuropsych areas, it will be quite expensive. And so in some ways we should prepare our minds and our efforts towards a uh, budget correction at midterm. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Souther. Uh, we are actually um, taking that into account already, and that's why we added the $22.2 million. And we are going to be a staging um, the NEUDO uh, Discovery straight Strategy, so that will come at the June meeting of next year. But we have a large um, initiative that has been taken into account here. So thank you, and it will come in September. Member Levitt. Me. Yes. Oh, thank you. Just checking. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I have. I'll, I'll say. I'll save it for lunch. Uh, so, when you look at the variance, can 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 you? Um, it, you've done your calculations. Is is this an increase in number of grants, or an increase of the size of each grant, or both? Given the conversations that have occurred. In, in various forms about the challenges of continuing to do this research on budget levels that were set some years ago. Oh, there you are. Uh, increase, yes, uh, I'll, I'll just stay here now for a bit. Uh, it's an increase in the size of the grants, a substantial increase that you will, uh, well, you will have to revise and approve and, uh, and an increase in numbers as well. So it's an increase in, in both, okay. In both, right. yes. yes. Just for discovery. Just talking about discovery right now, yes. Okay. I, I will deal with discovery and share labs and education, and my my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Chrissy, can deal with the translation on clinical. Okay. Thank you, Rosa. Is there any public comment? Aaron, I'm being told there's no public comment. No public. So uh, we're going to proceed to a vote to accept the form recommended for approval by the science subcommittee. I miss a misappropriated them. <laughs> uh, I said finance subcommittee. Um, so um, proceeding, all those in favor of this, accepting the proposed fiscal year 23-24 research budget, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. Okay. Mr. Tosher, if you would poll the members online. Haifa abdul -Haq. Yes. Dan Bernal. Aye. George Blumenthal? Yes. Linda Boxer? Yes. Fred Fisher? Aye. Judy Gasson? Yes. Larry Goldstein? Yes. Rich Lahara? Yes. David Lowe? Yes. Chris Miaskowski? Yes. And Michael Stamos? Yes. Great, thanks very much. The motion carries. Thank you. We're going to see uh, proceed to uh, agenda item number 13, which is a consideration of an update 
from the Neuro Task Force of the board. This will be presented by board member Larry Goldstein. Okay, let me get activated here. Uh, Marianne, if you could bring up the first slide, please. Or actually the second slide. We're working on it. And... Good, okay, great. So let me just give you a summary of where we are after half a dozen or so meetings. We've been meeting monthly since February, and those meetings have been devoted to a review of the current portfolio of uh, grants from CERM in a variety of areas of neuro, uh, a discussion of priorities, and a discussion of uh, really where we want to be moving forward. This slide just summarizes uh, the bulk of our conclusions. Um, first, uh, when we look at the fraction of the budget that is being spent in the neuro area, it is running at about the same percentage as the 1.5 billion set aside out of the total 5.5 billion. So that's that we would uh, expect slash hope uh, in order to hit that mark that it ought to be about 30%. And that's about what it's been running at. So there's no there's no, uh, in a sense, emergency <laughs> to be sure that we either decrease or increase the rate of spending in the neuro area because the grants working group is doing an appropriate job of sorting through the applications. Nonetheless, uh, when we uh, think about, you know, how much of that one and a half billion should we try to program, uh, at present, uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, sentiment in favor of trying to specify all of that one and a half billion. Uh, we think that the grant review system is, is doing just fine. But portfolio review uh, has suggested a couple things we should think about. And so Marianne, can we have the next slide, please? So this is one of several slides that the CERM team uh, created following a, a really excellent review of the portfolio. And it's, it's a measure of spending in uh, different areas of neuro disease relative to the disability index. DALI disabled uh, adjusted life years is one of several measures that can be used to measure the impact of a disease on the American population. And you know, although the funding doesn't necessarily uh, follow the, the, the disability index very closely, um, there's no reason at the moment to suspect with an exception or two that the grant review system is not doing an adequate job of uh, allocating based on the merit of the applications in the area. One major exception uh, you can see at the bottom there which are grants in the neuropsychiatric disease area, where you can see the disability index is enormous compared to most other diseases. And uh, you can see that our current commitment in this area is zero. And we felt that that was ultimately inappropriate. Uh, there's also a, a discussion uh, ensuing about uh, stroke, although it's, it's probably less urgent in the neuropsychiatric area. So Marianne, if you can go back to the previous slide. Uh, so conclusion number two there, uh, we're recommending an increased investment in neuropsychiatric disorders uh, where uh, uh, I'll, I'll come to uh, what our plans are in a moment uh, and possibly in stroke. Now, the... Uh, the other thing that has come up is something that the board just discussed uh, earlier in this meeting, which is size and duration of grant awards. Uh, we heard from some folks in the neuropsychiatric community in particular that the grant amounts uh, are really not large enough to support what they regard as uh, appropriate scientific and medical investments in this area. And I know that there's going to be uh, a continued board discussion of this uh, and probably some discussion in the task force. Item four uh, is uh, in particular for new work in neuropsychiatry, uh, psychiatric disease that we hope will be funded, 
uh, we really think there ought to be an, uh, a strong effort to put multidisciplinary teams together. Uh, the reason for that is that it's very clear that there are strong genetic influences on the development of neuropsychiatric disease. And at the very least, a team with stem cell biologists and biochemists ought to include geneticists to help figure out what sorts of individuals to generate stem cell lines from uh, for different neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, there's a mix uh, in that 50% heritability of single large effect rare factors uh, combined with much more common uh, uh, low effect individually uh, 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 genetic variants. Uh, and then finally, again, um, there was a discussion that came up in this area about uh, funding of small molecules. Uh, so I know Gil addressed that uh, uh, earlier in the meeting. I'll just point out that uh, in the neuropsychiatric area, you know, one hope would be that using stem cell models, it may be possible, for example, to find FDA approved drugs that have some influence on the behavior of neurons and glia derived uh, from individuals with, uh, you know, for example, schizophrenia or depression or what have you. Um, exactly how those would be funded to get them to clinical trials and then approval uh, may require at some point a uh, discussion of uh, funding of small molecule uh, proposals, uh, in particular, uh, those that don't necessarily depend on stem or progenitor cells uh, for their evaluation. Um, I think that this is not highly likely, but it may well happen, and we should prepare ourselves uh, at some point to uh, discuss this issue. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's the summary I wanted to uh, provide, and I'd be happy to take uh, questions from board members if there are any. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for that presentation. The floor is now open for comments and questions, starting with Shlomo. Uh, thanks, Larry. That was really a, a terrific assessment and uh, and very helpful uh, for understanding the landscape and also uh, blueprint for going forward. Um, I, I was struck by another inconsistency in the daily versus what we're funding, which also indirectly and directly uh, leads to stroke and Alzheimer's in, in your purview, and that is diabetes. Um, is there really zero in diabetes? I recall there were some diabetes grants, but if it is zero, I think that should appear as a as a as a trigger for stroke, and certainly should be considered because the the daily is very high. Uh, thank you, Shlomo. That that's an excellent point. I don't think we called out diabetes in the neuro area specifically in the portfolio analysis. Um, if uh, somebody from the CERM team can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, yeah. You've raised an interesting point, though, about whether we should include it in our uh, thinking about stroke, and I'll, I'll bring that to our next uh, uh, the task force meeting. Yeah, uh, the analysis that Dr. Chrissy and my team did only was for neuroscience um, related diseases, because we were, it, this was in the context of the neuro task, okay. task force. Yeah, because it would be interesting to compare the daily to that as well, and what our support is, because the daily is much higher than all, many of those there for diabetes. It's 14% of the healthcare GNP. Thank you, Shlomo. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, board member Fred Fisher. Hi, uh, Larry, and I apologize for missing the last task force meeting. So um, my question probably could have been asked and answered in the last meeting. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the daily. Um, and the way I heard you speak of it, which I might have misheard you, um, it's some reflection of um, either disease burden or um, burden on uh, Shlomo's comments suggest to me maybe it's not not about disease burden, but it's about sort of the uh, how much burden it puts on the healthcare system. So, um, could you clarify for me what the what the daily means? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, I, I'm I'm not an epidemiologist expert, but my understanding of it, Fred, is that it is the burden of disease on the individuals, not necessarily the healthcare system. I think I think the burden on the healthcare system is a is a different measure, that's not shown there. So, you know, the 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 neuropsychiatric disease burden, for example, you know, measures or estimates, you know, how how much does depression or mania or other uh, or schizophrenia uh, burden people's productive lives, and yeah. um, it's it's a it's a very important way of looking at disease. Cost obviously is important, but it doesn't measure the human impact necessarily, and I think that's what we're looking at there. So it, it may be that for neuropsych, um, it's an excellent measure of of burden and. Um, and, and certainly something that we should be uh, looking at. Um, if, if you can put that chart back up as the um, ALS MND patient advocate, um, the, the daily for uh, ALS and neurodegenerative diseases um, is among the lowest here, but few would argue that the burden of having ALS um, is small. <laughs> uh, so it might be that <clears throat> what we use to evaluate burden of disease, uh, we may need different tools um, because this one in my mind certainly does not capture uh, in any adequate way the burden of disease of that ALS and motor neuron disease um, and MS for that matter, which I'm also the patient advocate for. I, I think it's denominator, it's daily per 100,000. And because ALS is so rare, that, that, that's why the it, it comes out at 4.7 or 47, can't see. Well, if, right. I, I might, if I might add to that, Shlomo, uh, the other thing that, that you point out, Fred, is I think uh, completely correct. And, and that is that a disorder such as ALS that is rapidly lethal is going to underestimate the disease burden over time because the time that people have these sorts of things is so short. So, you know, a good question might be, uh, and we can we can take this up at a, another task force meeting. You know, what what does the grant portfolio look like, and are are grants missing something obvious uh, in the area of ALS? So, I wouldn't say that we've necessarily cut off further discussion of that. Yeah. And uh, your, your point is, I think, uh, uh, pretty reasonable uh, for these disorders that are so rapidly lethal. And represent uh, perhaps a smaller percentage of the, of the patient population. So we need a different tool to look at uh, what we're investing uh, and, and the burden of the disease on, on those um, populations suffering from what are considered uh, rare diseases. Thank it's you. Fair, it's a fair point. Dr. Goldstein, um, can I add a comment? Oh, yes, please, Rosa. Yeah, I just wanted to read how we calculated this. The DALI actually refre reflect is a time-based measure that combines years of life lost due to premature mortality mm. and years of life lost uh, due to time leave in states of less than full health or, or health. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to, and, and we did this per 100,000, and we took values that were um, uh, from the World Health Organizations and the Gates Foundation that has been um, calculating these over the years, and these are the most recent values. Yeah, I would just suggest that using the DALI when it comes to um, uh, fast progressing lethal diseases, um, that this is not the best illustration of investment versus impact. Um, because when you go from being perfectly functioning to losing the ability to speak, swallow, move, talk, and breathe within typically a two to five year period, and it's a rare disease, you're going to be underrepresented in the way that Rosa just described. And so uh, we need a variety of tools to express and understand how we are investing funds and the impact uh, or, or the the uh, and the impact of those diseases on those communities. 
as this one clearly is inadequate when it comes to uh, ALS and MND and MS. I, I think this is something we can take up at a future meeting, Fred. Um, I, I don't, I don't dispute uh, that there's value in continuing that discussion. You know, unfortunately, for many of these diseases, uh, advocates can make very strong arguments about what the right level of uh, allocation is, and as you know, that's always a, a, a tricky business. I think hitting neuropsych first uh, is is something where it's really been almost completely ignored in our portfolio and therefore constitutes a high priority. And, and there will be a concept plan coming from Vice President Kenneth Avales, uh short soon. But I don't want to be misunderstood. I, I'm not being critical of the priority of neuropsych. Uh, I'm being critical of using DALI um, when it comes to um, understanding our investment related to the impact of disease because it severely uh, underrepresents the burden of disease. Very good point, um, Member Mellon. Um, just a, another point, um, a nuance, uh, Larry, I don't know if you considered for epilepsy, for example, um, did, did you call out pediatrics? Because pediatric epilepsy and neonatal epilepsy is so much more common than adults. And I wonder if that shouldn't be emphasized it's a very significant uh, component of um, of the uh, neonatal uh, uh, morbidity population. Uh, let's see, Rosa or Abla, can you uh, address that, please? And do we have anything in pediatric uh, epilepsy? And if we don't, we, we should. I mean, I, I would I would argue that that's a very important uh, uh, daily for uh, for pediatric patients. We will have to look into this. Well, if we have epilepsy. Uh, you were talking about pediatric yeah, epilepsy. Yeah, did we call it out separately or in addition? So just in terms of the portfolio and the president's report, I reported on at least one program that's in clinical stage for pediatric um, focal epilepsy that's resistant to drugs, which is where we're finding some. So um, only one. Um, I There may be more in the translational portfolio, but I'll defer to Dr. Creasy for additional. Wrong. There's only one. That's the neurona, neurona program in clinical currently. We we don't have pediatrics in clinical yet. No, well, I would I would suggest that we that the task force consider the, that we call that out separately because it's is so important. Uh, Member Duran. Um, I wanted to pull out, uh, Larry, uh, a wrinkle and perhaps even from left field, but I would like to see some data that represents the impact of these diseases on communities of color, which are sometimes the impact is even greater as a result of social determinants of health. And therefore, I would like to see if they're actually receiving or being included I mean, this gets really complex, but are they being equally included so that they're getting the benefit of the uh, research, the trials, et cetera, uh, because they might be disproportionately impacted by some of these diseases. One of the things we saw particularly during COVID was the, uh, the mental, emotional impact on many of our communities, but for the first time, what I was seeing per, and a response from the Latino community was they were actually admitting to the need for emotional help, that they were actually admitting that there was an issue in terms of mental health. And so that's a messaging issue. It's an investment issue. It's a way to bring them to the table for clinical trials through our clinical our, our cancer uh, centers of excellence. Sorry, I said, keep saying that. I'm going to have to wipe it off my tongue. Um, and, and so if we don't see it reflected in the data, it's just this mass stuff, then I don't know how to message back to my community um, how if this is helping them, if they're being impacted, if they're engaged uh, and what they need to do in order to do and address these issues that they're finally admitting are part of their the community impact. 
So I don't know if you can pull that data out, if it exists, if anybody's tried to look at it, but I think it is really critical if we're in fact going to begin messaging to these vulnerable populations as well. And I would also, oh, sorry. I th thank you for that comment, Isabel. I think um, I, I'm sure that the numbers exist somewhere. Um, we did not discuss the details of those numbers thus far, but I will tell you that as a general matter, the task force is aware that underserved communities and communities of color are in fact very highly impacted by these sorts of disorders and absolutely need to be included moving forward. The messaging will be critical to be sure that um, as genetic studies not supported by CIRM and perhaps those that we partner on are uh, continued in the coming years, I'm, I'm relatively sure that some of them are trying to get into communities of color, and it's certainly a community that we, we absolutely have to engage uh, moving forward here. Thank you, Member Malkus. Oh, actually, I would love to echo that and also draw a point to the children have been so profoundly affected in those communities by this. So I, I wanna echo your point. Uh, yes, Pat Levitt. So, so there is there is data on selective in DSM five disorders that that speak to your point directly, and particularly in pediatric populations, it has a, a very large impact on time to first diagnosis, which of course then affects time to first intervention. So, African American uh, children have the, the the largest gap between the the mean which is about 3.2 years for autism spectrum disorder, for example, and first diagnosis for that commute for, for children who are in those families, which is about six years old. So it's school age, right? The gap is closing, but slowly. There's also now, and in, in a large NIH funded study genetics that includes uh, a large um, Latino populations, um, Almost all of the genetics and identifying mutations are based on Northern European data. And so that's changing as well. But as you know, it's really a, a heavy lift to work with communities, particularly with organizations that are in co communities to talk about why it's important to participate in research. So th there is a, a not just a growing awareness, but there's a large effort on the part of the research community to be very inclusive, but the research community folks need need, need help in doing this um, the right way, right? But the point you you make is is absolutely spot on. You know, well, I'll just point out. You just add, it, sorry, Larry. I just say, but we need to see the data, you know, and because otherwise, we don't buy it, right? There's just too many people who don't uh, believe it, and so we need to see the data. Uh, and I know that pulling that out might be difficult, uh, whether staff can help with that, but I just think overarchingly, we just need to see it so I can go back and, you know, and use that. I mean, all of us research program in which they claim to have now the largest genomic database, uh, uh, diverse database, uh, showed that 16% of the enrollees are Latino. So when you say you can't get them to get engaged, you can, but who's calling them out and what are they telling them and how are they listening to them and in what language are they talking? So I think we're, as you say, uh, Pat, there is, there, it's the devil's in the details of how we're going to do this, but we need the data. So it has to be called out and pulled out. Isabel, I just wanted to mention to you that we're committed to doing that. We're in the process of collecting that kind of data from the clinical trials. And so as soon as we have critical amounts that are worthy of analysis, we will be doing that. So we heard you. That's sad, Abla, that are worthy of calling out, you know. No, the, no, numbers wise. No, but I, you know, know. The, the, you know. <laughs> I guess I use the, the but I appreciate word. it. Thank you. All I'm saying is that if we had only five patients, it, it, what do these data mean? But if we have 25, I can then describe trends for you the way we did here. Let, let me just add a technical point. So, so first of all, Israel, I agree we should we should have a look at those data. 
I want to remind everybody that in order for stem cell projects to be initiated in some of these areas, in particular in neuropsychiatry, we depend very heavily on the genetic analyses done by the genetics community. Uh, at present, CIRM is not supporting uh, you know, genome-wide screens in any of these communities. Uh, it's an important question to, to what extent should we become involved in stimulating uh, those uh, projects. And, and I think as we start to develop some pilot projects in the portfolio, we'll start to learn to what extent the stem cell community is engaged with the genetics community and to what extent we can encourage that. Dr. Ahead, Goldstein, Rosa. can I, can I, um, I would like to add, yeah. um, so um, this conversation about ancestral diversity had come up earlier on, and as we were developing and brainstorming about the neuro discovery uh, initiative, one of the things that the CERN team did was start discussing what's out there, what is the National Institute of Mental Health funding, what are other organizations funding. So there's actually a very large cohort of ancestor with ancestral diversity, genotyping and clinical phenotyping of diverse populations across the world, thousands of schizophrenia and bipolar disease, and they are actually currently uh, looking for a partner <laughs> to derive uh, some, some lines, uh, IPS lines, so that we could have, actually, this could be something that this is a proposal for later, just wanted to bring it up to the board that this might come up at the task force level, but this could be a very good resource for us to partner and answer some of the questions that and, 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 and boys that, uh, that we are identifying in this discussion. Just wanted to bring it up. I'm happy to present it uh, at a later time. Thank you, Rosa. Any other comments from board members in the room or online? or from the public. Okay, uh, this was a, a very good conversation. I'm sure the Neuro Task Force is going to take uh, this back for consideration and they are going to make a presentation, I think more formally at the next board meeting in September. With that, I would like to have a temporary recess for lunch and then we will come back and listen to um, Dr. Turbeville's uh, report on AAWG. We'll come back at 1240, okay. so half an hour. Perfect, thank you.
If everyone can please resume their seats. We'll take up the final member um, item on the agenda. We'll give everyone a few seconds to get settled. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we have one uh, item on the formal agenda remaining, and that is an update on accessibility and affordability working group. And the presentation will be led by um, Dr. Sean Tuberville, our Vice President for Medical Affairs. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, and good afternoon. I want to thank the Chairman, of course, and Vice Chair, members of the ICOC, and members of the public. Um, I think it's first to say that uh, this is probably my last presentation to the ICOC. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude um, and appreciation for the opportunity to work for CIRM. CIRM is an amazing place, uh, particularly um, the extraordinary organization with respect to the tireless work that I see from the CIRM employees, uh, the staff, um, the groundbreaking investigative therapies for California patients deserves immense recognition. And sometimes I hear talking to colleagues that People still don't know who CIRM is, and it's uh, just uh, quite surprising to me, given all the work that I see internally as well as externally, but I'm, I'm certain that that will change over time. So the dedication and remarkable achievements of CIRM in this field is uh, truly inspiring and certainly appreciate the opportunity to build a medical affairs organization. Uh, we did a lot of work in 14 months, and I'd like to now move to the presentation today. And what I'll be speaking to is um, our introduction to our proposed roadmap to access and affordability. And the last four to five months, we've been engaging with the AAWG on different concepts that would should be considered from ICOC, uh, the opportunity to be in a roadmap for access and affordability. So I'm gonna focus on why we are creating the roadmap, review the potential problem statement and the opportunity areas to address barriers to access and affordability. And then at the end of this, present a couple of concepts that I'd like to get feedback on that we could consider for near-term opportunity within the roadmap. So it's critical to take a moment to reflect on the purpose behind the development of the proposed roadmap. So why are we doing this? So Proposition 14 and the five-year strategic plan state that CIRM will support the development of a roadmap for access and affordability in concordance with CIRM's Access and Affordability Working Group, the AEWG. The roadmap will include a strategy for gathering data to support reimbursement, engaging policymakers and regulators, and developing novel healthcare delivery models. It will also manage future initiatives involving post-marketing research, follow-up and outcome databases, registry development, real-world evidence research, healthcare economics, and patient-reported outcomes. As we dive into various recommendations, you will notice that these suggestions are in line with the language outlined in the Proposition 14 and our five-year strategic plan that I just described. So no doubt about it, cell and gene therapies have a significant impact on patients. And we've seen that time and time again over a number of different therapeutic areas. However, there are also some challenges and we could perhaps start with a problem statement, but also some opportunities. One of the problem statements says there are several logistical and financial barriers to clinical trials and approved therapies for cell and gene therapies. We've seen over and over again the challenges for patients and family members to participate in many of these trials. The opportunity that we have is in Proposition 14, which provides dedicated funding 
and the formation of the Access and Affordability Working Group to address these barriers. The goal of the roadmap is to identify near-term and longer-term initiatives to help prevent patients overcome some of these barriers to access and affordability. So I want to take a little bit of time to focus on this slide. So we've done a lot of due diligence on barriers that uh, prevent patients from having access to clinical trials. And there are a number of opportunities and a number of programs within CIRM that are already in play and others that we wanna recommend that will mitigate some of the barriers. So if we think about initiatives that mitigate negative social and cultural determinants of health, one, we already have the expansion of the Alpha Clinics, right? So that went from six to nine. And there are a number of offerings within those awards that actually address uh, and some of them mitigate the negative social and cultural determinants of health. And I'll speak to those in a few minutes. We also have the community outreach and education. This is a new department that's just starting to gear up starting to think through outreach programs that would help with education uh, and other opportunities. We also have the Future Community Care Centers of Excellence. This is a big initiative uh, I'll speak to in a few minutes. And then community partners. Uh, I've learned recently through this journey how important community-based organizations are in interacting with patients, uh, getting the word across, educating on cell and gene therapies, uh, et cetera. When we think about CIRM programs to address informational barriers, this is where our patient support program sits. And so the patient support program provides a number of services. One, navigating patients to the right clinical trial. So CIRM has, what, about 91 trials currently uh, enrolled. The other thing is information, information about the trial. Um, information for healthcare providers and patients is absolutely key. When we think about programs to help patients navigate logistical barriers, and this is one of the variables that consistently comes up in, in participating in trials, is how can I get to the site? Um, how you know the, the expenses that take place, um, family, uh, childcare, etc. Um, this too is where it can be supported by the patient support program. And when we think about logistics, there's an opportunity for the patient support program to help with the site, organize the patient in terms of logistics to the site, going back and forth, home, et cetera. The other thing with respect to um, financial, um, within the patient support program, there's also the patient access fund. And this is an RFA that's posted right now. That, that patient access fund sits within the patient support program. This is a $15.6 million that is dedicated directly to supporting patients through trials. And again, we know those out-of-pocket out patient expenses can be high. Uh, in fact, there's recent data to suggest that out-of-pocket pa patient expenses can be anywhere between five to eight higher um, than what you would see in patients who are participating in non-cell and gene therapy trials. And then, so, while CIRM's effort primarily focuses on addressing barriers to clinical trials, it is crucial to acknowledge that removing all barriers, even if we had the opportunity, does not necessarily mean patients are always going to get access to drugs. Maria Milan just gave a presentation today about candidates, drug candidates that demonstrated efficacy that still can't get to the marketplace. So FDA approval and reimbursement for a therapy are essential aspects to ensure that all California patients have meaningful access to cell and gene therapies beyond just the clinical trial stage. So I'll talk to you a little bit about supporting broad and fair coverage for cell and gene therapies. A couple of components, I'll get back into them in more detail later. One is thinking about the research with respect to real world evidence and health outcomes and opportunities and that impact on access and affordability. Another is the engagement with payers. And third is outcomes-based performance models, which are absolutely critical with respect to reimbursement, um, et cetera. So I'd like to direct you to this slide. This is our proposed roadmap to access and affordability, and it is color-coded. 
So the orange to the left of the slide represents approved CIRM funded programs. So right now we have the expansion of the alpha clinics and we have the patient support program. The navy blue depicts three proposed strategies in the middle that I will focus on today uh, further on with my discussion. And then the gray component indicates an important program that is currently in progress. And of course, that's the community care centers of excellence. And the way we design this is also thinking through much more long-term future initiatives. So for the purpose for this presentation is really to think about short-term, near-term opportunities that we can help patients with respect to access and affordability. So let's first talk about approved programs. So the expansion of the Alpha Clinics. Uh, this program aligns with Prop 14 and involves expanding the existing network of Alpha Clinics. The nine sitters of excellence offer various clinical services resources that allow CIRM to gather additional information for future considerations related to access and affordability. As part of the expansion, there are specific offerings within, within the awards such as patient navigation, coverage analysis, new financial models, DEI initiatives, and other offerings that are incorporated to enhance the patient support and access. So as these studies continue to enroll, we'll be able to get information from the Alpha Clinics on the reporting that will give us guidance in terms of where there may be additional opportunities for access and affordability related to these variables. The other is the patient support program. And this is offsetting the cost of providing treatments and cures arising from Institute funding research. So the activity here is to create consistent, efficient, streamlined and reliable access to resources and support across all the different types of CERM funded programs. Again, these are two programs that are progressing and are part of the proposed roadmap and directly align with the Proposition 14. Now I wanna talk about the program in progress, and this is the Community Care Centers of Excellence. So this aligns with Proposition 14, and that is enhance the geographical distribution to promote patient access to trials and create novel healthcare delivery models. So this is an ongoing program. The medical affairs team worked uh, tirelessly. Many people here in this room gave a lot of guidance and attended not only the three listening sessions, but just recently the uh, public session that we had last week. And um, these community care centers of excellence are qualified sites with clinical, operational, and educational expertise to provide rural communities access to investigational cell and gene therapy trials. The CCE holds significant importance as it will serve as a crucial component of the roadmap, particularly in supporting clinical trials in rural communities. So at this stage, as Dr. Malan mentioned earlier today, we are now starting to develop the concept plan. That concept plan will be presented to the Access and Affordability Working Group, to the Scientific Committee, and then hopefully to the ICOC for final consideration into an RFA. And our expectation is that through that process, an RFA could be posted as early as Q2 of the first half of 2024. So this is a slide that was uh, developed by my colleague, Jeff. And by integrating the Alpha Clinics, the Community Care Centers of Excellence, the CIRM funded trials and the patient support program, this collaborative approach will allow the creation of more robust strategies and initiatives that address the specific needs of diverse communities, enhance accessibility, and accessibility to innovative therapies and promote affordability for patients across different regions. So if you think about this, of course, we've got the Alpha Clinics, those are the nine lead sites and centers, centers of excellence. The community care centers of excellence bring the clinical capacity to the community. The CIRM clinical trials, now 91 CIRM funded trials are in play. And then you 
you know, tack on board the patient support program that will provide the additional financial and logistical barriers. So now what I'd like to do is discuss the proposed initiatives for consideration. So possible strategy number one is supporting funding of California disease registries and other real world data collection. We know that the FDA and payers have requirements now for real world data. They have a significant impact on clinical dossiers that go to the FDA, and they have an even more importance with respect to reimbursement. So the benefit here is it enhances opportunity for approved and payer reimbursement when data is appropriately substantiated according to FDA guidance and payer mandates. Patients will have access to the treatment if approved and reimbursed by payers. So as an example, Dr. Milan, and there are others, just recently we heard about the most recent gene therapy that was approved for DMD. And in that clinical package that went to the FDA, that BLA, not only did it include open label phase two trial data, but it also included real world evidence and data from disease registry. And that was important because it did provide sub analyses that were asked of the committee uh, on a number of different variables. And we're seeing this over and over again with other uh, products that are being presented to the to the FDA through BLA or even an NDA for that matter. So payers are also beginning to set up their infrastructure, what the requirements are um, with real world data. Uh, the AMCP dossier that you may be familiar with, that is the gold standard uh, formulary submission that goes to all the payers that includes public as well as private. They have guidelines on how you can use real world data to support to support uh, the clinical efficacy, more importantly, effectiveness out there in the real world. So one has to start thinking through um, in the absence of real world data and, well, let me back up. My point being is, so now we must consider the potential consequences for patients if disease registries and other real world data sources are not utilized for regulatory and payer submission in improving access. So there are a couple of recommendations here. One, we recommend additional research. Where have disease registries been impactful mm -hmm. for regulatory approval? Two, where have disease registries and other real world data been successfully submitted to payers? And how can this knowledge be applied for CIRM funded trials, particularly when we start asking the questions about patient and economic outcomes? By conducting such research and utilizing these disease registries and other real world data sources effectively, CIRM can provide a new funding mechanism to provide awardees the best chance for success for regulatory approval, thereby facilitating access to approved novel therapies. So that is possible strategy number one, support the funding of real world data and disease registries. A possible second strategy is engaging with payers. So the benefit here is it creates proactive understanding of payer issues, necessary data needed for appropriate payment models. And there's a couple of recommendations by the AWG. One, let's put out a payer survey, a robust sur survey that asks a number of questions among private as well as public payers to understand what their, their challenges are related to cell and gene therapy reimbursement. This survey could provide valuable information on payer expectations and data requirements, aiding in the development of appropriate reimbursement strategies. That would be recommendation number one. After that, there was a recommendation to actually have a payer advisory board. And establishing a robust payer advisory board led by the Access and Affordability Working Group, this board could bring together payers, 
and other relevant stakeholders to provide ongoing guidance, advice, and feedback on reimbursement strategies, policy considerations, and payer engagement. By undertaking these research opportunities and actively engaging with payers, CIRM could gain insights into the payer landscape, address payer concerns, foster collaborative um, relationships. This pro proactive approach can help guide appropriate reimbursement strategies, anticipate potential policy restrictions, and ensure that CIRM funded therapies have access to favorable reimbursement frameworks. So that's possible strategy number two. Possible strategy number three focuses on the federal and state policy issues. So the benefit of this is developing an understanding of the state policy to support proactive communication and development of CERM policies with key California agencies. One particular opportunity is to work with CMS. So CMS, particularly the Center for Medicare Medicaid Innovation, that's called CMMI, has now reached out to states and reached out to states to get guidance on what the payer outcome-based models should look like. And so this is a voluntary opportunity. Um, you don't have to do it. But what we were thinking is that this would be an opportunity for CIRM to collaborate with other state organizations within California to provide feedback of what we think are important when it comes to value, particularly value of cell and gene therapies. So this would be a great opportunity to interact with CMS, provide guidance, um, particularly when it comes to those outcomes-based models. And just to briefly speak about outcomes-based models, value-based contracts, they're not all the same. And some of them work really well in oncology, some of them work well, really well in gene therapy, but for neuromuscular diseases, for example, uh, they're a little bit difficult. And so it gives us an opportunity to take the lead and provide some guidance uh, to the CMS in terms of what California appreciates with respect to value. Another opportunity that was recommended to us is to further explore the Cancer Care Equity Act. Now, there's an ongoing discussion uh, on the Cancer Care e Equity Act uh, among other stakeholders uh, with respect to exploring opportunities to expand the language of this law. And basically how this law was set up is that it, it, it mandates, well, it doesn't really mandate. Um, what it does is a, a good faith principle, and that is any cancer patients that recently diagnosed, um, they have the right to be treated at an NCI certified site, much like all the alpha clinics. Um, one of the drawbacks to this is it's not mandated. That is, that you don't have to tell the patient. Um, it's with a good faith principle. And so the AWG and a number of other colleagues thought it may be a good opportunity to CIRM to get involved with perhaps updating this legislation to actually have it mandated. That is, any cancer patient that's diagnosed, they get the opportunity to not only be treated at the community center, but also have a much more robust 360 care uh, at one of the NCI certified sites. And then finally, um, another opportunity on the payer side is to work with the Office of Health and Affordability. And um, Senator Art Torres got us in connected with this group. Uh, it's part of the governor's team. It is a big initiative. Uh, many of you were on that call with me. Uh, there is interest in collaboration. Right now, they are just setting up the infrastructure. Um, Cell and gene therapy for them right now is not a bug, big in, you know, budget impact model or impacts the, the budget uh, framework, but there is interest for us to give guidance to them in terms of what's in the pipeline, uh, what that looks like. Right now, the FDA is expecting anywhere from 15 to 20 new approvals a year uh, into the future on cell and gene therapies. And when you start thinking about the cost of those therapies, even though they're not large from a you know, patient population standpoint, cumulatively, it will have a, a large impact on budget impacts for payers. So there's a good opportunity and that, that has already kicked off. Um, so look forward to um, potentially future collaborations with that group um, on behalf of, of course, our, our vice chair as well. So those are three possible strategies for near-term <laughs> opportunities. 
And when you think about roadmap elements, um, this is not necessarily a timeline, but just gives you an example of what we're thinking from a near-term standpoint. Again, we have the approved products. That's the expansion of the Alpha Clinics that kicked off in January of this year. The patient support program that RFA has posted, we're hoping that we'll be able to launch that in the second half of next year. In progress, of course, is the Community Care Centers of Excellence. That's gonna give that opportunity uh, for clinical trial uh, activities out in the rural communities, education, et cetera. That is a very big initiative. And then we have the possible strategies. So disease registries and real world evidence, if in fact that's something we want to pursue, that could be kicked off as early as September of this year. Uh, a payer advisory group meeting, which was recommended, could kick off in December of this year. And then policy opportunities, we'd have to really think through some of the strategies, who we want to engage with, uh, and the deliverable, but that could easily be kicked off in January of 2024. And then through these learning sessions, we'll be able to identify new future strategies. Uh, one of the challenges with cell and gene therapy is the framework is changing daily, right? Um, the payer pathways are changing constantly. Uh, manufacturing's changing, distribution's changing. And so it's tough to get a handle on a trajectory of where you want to go four or five years from now. So it's really about baby steps and really the near-term objectives that we might be able to have an impact for patients with respect to access and affordability. And so with that, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to present what we have to date on near-term opportunities and do want to open it up to a specific question. And that is based on what I reported today, are the proposed research activities appropriate as initial steps of implementation for the roadmap to access and affordability? Chairman, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tuberville. Uh, Leandra, did you have, want to start the conversation? I'm very quiet, I don't talk much. So. Um, Thank you. Great report and congratulations on your tenure here at, at CERM. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that I thought was really great was the, the idea around a payer advisory board. Um, and I just wondered, it made me think about, I know that there are, my understanding is that there are some patient kind of advisory boards and groups that you all work with in other ways, but wondering if it might make sense to also think about that as part of this uh, discussion, um, even not just patients, because it might make sense to have specific patients for specific, specific areas where you need that feedback, but also including like community or stakeholders, particularly cultural informants. I know we talk about a, that a lot in this communication subgroup, but the importance of like who you're working with to get the message about everything out to the community, right? So even if those key cultural informants sat on some type of like community advisory board as well, as well wherever it makes sense, it's just something that's going around in my head right now as you talked about the payer board, a nice balance to it, I think. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I think that would provide a much more robust uh, interaction. Yeah, thank you. There's a board member. Yeah, a board board member, uh, Bernal, is yes. next. Uh, first of all, Sean, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Um, there's a lot of innovative work in there. It's been a pleasure working with you over these years, and you'll certainly be missed um, here at CIRM. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about uh, the strategy that relates to engaging with the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, that seems to be a really good idea with regard to Medicaid, since that's a population that we're hoping to target um, in making our trials and treatments available. How would that fit in with uh, Sharon Bastiani's uh, statements earlier about our sort of having a lack of or, or not having enough of a presence and engagement with federal lawmakers and how, how would we go about um, implementing that strategy given our current resources or would it require more staff? Yeah, certainly. So Dr. Mbassiani certainly would certainly piggyback uh, your vision uh, of getting into the beltway for the most part and interacting with uh, on, on the federal level. So uh, that's a strategy that certainly could be put in play, but uh, certainly encourage when they're asking us to come out and, and, and give guidance, um, uh, that's analogous to uh, payers reaching out to, uh, let's say, a biopharma company, which happens rarely. Uh, when they do ask us for guidance, uh, we, we listen. And uh, so it's a unique opportunity. I think that would be great synergy. Um, yes, we're responding when they ask us, but I, I had in mind uh, us asking them to ask us. 
do that too. Great, thank you. Ambla, did you want to make a comment? Just a comment regarding advisory panels. So Leandro, we actually have in our strategic plan, marketing approval advisory panels, and we're in the process of getting those started. And we will include people like payers in those panels. So it's along the lines of what you were suggesting. And thank you for making that. Thank you. Hey, Member Levitt. So, Scott, we, so we've, we've, we've talked about this often, that in each of those domains and, and what you propose there are um, unique challenges for in, all, in each of those domains for affordability and accessibility for pediatric populations. So um, as you've gone through this, what it, I, I'd be interested in your view of how to differentiate that in, in a way or a positive way that, that those issues can be addressed specifically because they won't be addressed fully or maybe not at all if, the, if it's a very adult disease-centric uh, set of activities that goes on, and I don't, I don't have to belabor it. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, certainly, and it is an um, sort of an overlooked issue, to be quite honest with you. It's, um, there are opportunities with the state, uh, uh, state-funded programs that uh, are trying to improve uh, exactly what you just discussed and what we've discussed in the past. Um, you know, Medicaid is Medicaid, um, and to be honest with you, I think we'd have to do a little bit more due diligence in identifying what opportunities are available on the pediatric side. Have, have you had conversations with, or maybe others have had conversations at the state level for those who sort of see this as, as um, you know, carrying a torch for, you know, on, on the legislative side to try to deal with this? Because you could, I can imagine, I don't even have to imagine because it exists now that the identical a treatment that would be reimbursed differently if it's a child versus if it's an adult, right? So are, are there champions that can be engaged in some way? Because otherwise, from my perspective, it's like speaking into the wind that's blowing at you. <laughs> so it doesn't go very far. Yeah, certainly. And, and, and what you're specifically getting at is really those reimbursement rates for certain organizations, right? Certain hospitals. And um, yeah, I think that would be a, an initiative that, uh, and I can't speak for CERM specifically, but certainly take it back to the access and affordability working group and see if there's uh, any opportunity there where we could uh, perhaps champion some new language that uh, we could take to the legislature. Yeah. And the other thing is that there's, there's also different needs for infrastructure at the health clinics and other areas that because the a, a family a caregiver bringing a child to uh, to a, a treatment visit is, is different than than even a caregiver bringing a, an elderly uh, you know adult to uh, to treatment and so whether there's going to be appropriate infrastructure to deal with that so that accessibility will be actually balanced i think will be important to do as well i don't have any solutions to this I just, you know. yeah <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's a pressing issue. I was going to say, I think you do have a solution. I think you proposed one around finding legislative champions and others. And I think if that's appropriate or if that's needed, the, that should be looked at. And if there's other ways of doing that without having to take that step, I think that that's worth further discussion as well. I don't see um, additional board comment uh, either um, outside the room or inside the room. So this is not an action item. We're going to proceed to our last item on the agenda. Is there any member of the public that would like to make comment on any item, whether on the agenda or not? There are no public comments. No public comments. Then let me give my personal thanks to all the board members for making this a very sweet um, and uh, productive meeting, but very, very nice for me. Thank you very much. And I think we are adjourned.
Uh, housekeeping, a just a little housekeeping, just quick. Uh, your next in person, we will welcome you back here on the last Thursday of September, uh, September 28th, same time. And uh, the application review subcommittee will resume its regularly scheduled programming on July, uh, July 27th. Sorry. That's also the last Thursday, as well as August 31st. So those are your your next meetings coming up in the next quarter.